have 45 minutes, I will talk a little bit about um, positioning in general, radio-based positioning, and then the, the second part I'll talk about 5G positioning. So for me, 5G, massive MIMO, millimeter wave, it's not a communication system. It's a positioning opportunity. Okay, so I will look at things from a slightly different perspective. This will be my outline for this morning. So the first part before the break, principle of radio-based positioning. What kind of measurements can you get from radio signals and how do you use them to position devices? And then after the coffee break, I'll talk about why is 5G good for positioning? Okay. So what are the, the benefits of using 5G signals for positioning? Then we go on two tracks. Uh, first, positioning in the sub-6 gigahertz band, so using massive MIMO. And then positioning in the above 28 gigahertz band, using millimeter wave signals. I'll spend a few minutes also in the end talking about cooperative positioning. This would be device-to-device -device positioning. And if time is left over, I'll also talk a little bit about the synergy between communication and positioning. All right, so first, principles of radio-based positioning. So here I'll first talk a little bit about what kind of measurements you can take with radio signals. Uh, I'll spend quite a, little, quite a lot of time on fundamental performance bounds. So maybe by a show of hands, who has used uh, Fisher Information and Kramer rail bounds? Okay, so maybe 30, 40%. Okay, so I'll go over this uh, in quite some detail. Then I go over algorithms. How can you then uh, fuse measurements and f determine the position fix? And finally, maybe a little bit about mobility. All right. So in general, waveforms uh, are, are closely tied to the geometry <coughs> of the propagation. Okay, so I, propag I, I send a radio signal. There's a line of sight component, which is related to the distance. And that could be reflection and scattering and diffraction, which is related to the obstacles in the environment. And then depending on the frequency at which you operate, uh, this relation between the propagation and the, the physical environment becomes more explicit. Uh, you can take different kinds of measurements. So for instance, here is a propagation environment. And this will be a waveform at the receiver side using very large bandwidth. Okay, so you see all the multipath components resolved. And then uh, the, the first path here would tell you something if you're in line of sight about the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. That's not the only kind of measurement you can take. You can also measure signal strength. And through the path loss equation, get some measure of distance. You can estimate angles if you have directional or multiple antennas. And you can also estimate things like Doppler shifts, for instance, which give you an indication about velocity. Now, um, radio-based positioning is used a lot. Uh, so for instance, the GPS system is a radio-based positioning system. Okay, so GPS is a very low-rate communication system. And the, the, the radio waveforms that you receive, you then determine uh, your position based upon. So how GPS works is more or less as follows. You have a number of uh, satellites that are uh, perfectly synchronized with a global clock, let's say. Uh, they send signals to users on Earth using a CDMA type uh, well, spread spectrum waveforms. <coughs> the receiver here has a low cost device. Okay, so its clock is not very precise. It estimates time of arrival with respect to all the received waveforms. And it needs then four satellites to solve a four-dimensional um, uh, problem. It's four-dimensional because it wants to determine its position, x, y, z, and its clock offset. Okay. But once it's solved this problem, it can have a relatively good position fix. And also, as a side effect, it can have a very good clock. It can basically be synchronized to some extent to the, to the satellites. OK, so this is a very common way of doing positioning. Of course, GPS suffers some from problems. For instance, it does not work indoor because the signals are too weak to propagate inside. Other types of measurements you could take are, for instance, signal strength. So this is a typical figure of uh, transmitter-receiver separation and the, the path loss that you would observe. Um, and then you could say, OK, if I measure certain received power, I could then, through this path loss equation, translate this to a distance. Um, if you do this, uh, even from this figure, you can tell if you have a certain received power, there's a lot of uncertainty in the distance. Right? You could be 10 meters up to 50 meters. There's huge errors can be made in this case. So I would say received signal strength as an indication of distance is, is a poor kind of measurement. What is very often done instead is to use something called fingerprinting for positioning. So in fingerprinting, you would measure received signal strength with respect to many, say, Wi-Fi access points. And this creates a fingerprint. This vector is a fingerprint. And then the, you could correlate this vector with the database. And that will give you an indication of where you are. 
So that's a, a reasonable way to use signal strength for positioning. Um, another type of measurement is time. So typically when you have a transmitter and a receiver device, <coughs> transmitter sends a signal at a certain time, S of t. The receiver observes it sometime later. And this sometime later is uh, dependent on the distance and the speed of light. Okay. So by estimating the time of arrival of the first path, you could say something about the distance up to a clock bias, right? because the transmitter and the receiver may not be perfectly synchronized. Okay, so this clock bias, you should be able to remove this before you can convert your measurement to a distance. Another challenge in these kind of measurements are obstacles. Right? So if there's an obstacle between the transmitter and the receiver, um, even if the waveform propagates through this obstacle, it will be, de it will be delayed a little bit okay, because of the relative permittivity of the object. So the delay depends on the size of the object and the relative permittivity. And this could be, depending on the type of object, up to a few meters. Uh, a more problematic case is when the line of sight is blocked. Okay, when you put some uh, metal object in between, the line of sight may be blocked, and then <coughs> the first arriving path would be from a reflector. And now you can have huge biases in your distance estimates. So these are some <coughs> of the challenges that you have in distance estimation. Now, the most fundamental one, of course, is this clock bias. So how can you somehow synchronize those two devices? Okay, because if, if they don't have a common notion of time, then an estimate of the time of arrival is meaningless in order to convert it to a distance. A very common way to deal with this is a two-way time of arrival. In two-way time of arrival, a transmitting device sends a signal at a certain time, which it records, S of t. It arrives sometime later at the receiving device. Okay, and this time is related to the distance, of course. This receiving device <coughs> measures the signal in its own clock. Okay, and then sends a signal back some pre-agreed time later. Okay, so maybe 20 milliseconds later, it sends a signal back. And this is recorded by this device. Okay. Now, this measurement is taken in the original clock of the transmitting device. So based on this measurement, it can figure out the distance. Okay, so the time of arrival measurement here is related to the distance two times the distance, because you go two times over the air, plus noise at this side, noise at this side, and a pre-agreed time. Okay, so this is called two-way time of arrival. Okay, so I send a message, you send me basically an echo back, and based on that I know the distance, and I don't need to explicitly estimate any clock biases. And this is very often used, for instance, in uh, ultra-wideband systems. Okay, some of the drawbacks here is that you need uh, a dedicated transaction for each ranging uh, measurement. Okay, while in, in GPS, for instance, you, you get all the measurements simultaneously. So this could be slow. You typically also need dedicated hardware to do this, because you need to be able to estimate the time of arrival very precisely and be able to send the signal back at a pre-agreed time. Uh, to relax these requirements, what is often done, for instance, in cellular positioning, is time difference of arrival. Okay, so here you would have a, a cell phone with an unknown clock bias. It would send a waveform, it would broadcast a waveform to all the base stations around at a time that it decides. And then all the base stations would observe the waveform. Okay. All the base stations have a common notion of time, so they're perfectly synchronized. Okay. So the signal received at a certain base station I would be related to the distance I between the user node and the base station. And of course, depend on this unknown clock bias. So the base station I measures the time of arrival, it's given by this. And they can take differential measurements. So they select among all base stations a reference base station and take differential measurements. And these differential measurements depend on the differences of distances, but they remove the clock bias. So the clock bias is gone. Okay, so this is a way by having synchronized base stations to avoid having the need <coughs> for synchronized uh, user device. Okay, some of the challenges here, of course, is that you need all these base stations to be very accurately synchronized. I should here bear in mind that a synchronization error of one nanosecond corresponds to 30 centimeters, right? Because in one nanosecond, the light travels 30 centimeters. You need a central processing unit, okay, which is well, reasonable for a cellular infrastructure. Uh, measurement noise of these differential measurements will be correlated, so you need to be a little bit careful with the processing. And also the quality of the positioning depends on who you choose as a reference base station. So it makes a difference whether you choose this guy or this guy as a reference. Beyond time measurements, you can also take angle measurements. Okay, so here is a case where you have a user device with one antenna. 
you have another device, could be a base station, let's say, with multiple antennas, here a ULA, and then the received waveform would depend on the transmitted waveform, the time difference, the time of flight, and also the response at the receiver side. Okay, so this here is the angle of arrival. Similarly, if you have a transmitting device with many antennas and a receiver device with one antenna, then you could relate the received waveform with the transmitted waveform, the time of flight, and also the angle of departure. Okay, so in principle, this guy here, after suitable processing, could determine the angle of departure. Similarly, this guy here, after suitable processing, could determine the angle of arrival. Uh, we will often here work with ULAs, just because they're simple, they're elegant. You can, of course, extend this to a planar arrays and other type of arrays. Okay, so for ULAs, these responses would be given by this. So they're basically van der Monde vectors uh, related to the angle, uh, the wavelength at which you operate, and the separation between the antenna elements. Okay, of course, here you need multiple antennas for this to work. And, for instance, if in this case you want to estimate the angle of arrival and then be able to tie this to the position, you would need to know where this guy is. Okay? And you also need to know the orientation of this device. We'll go into this in a lot more detail later. All right, so these are the typical kind of measurements that you would take. Uh, any question about this before we go on to uh, performance files? Yes? Yeah, of course, of course. This is the angle. Okay, this under line of sight, this is what you will get. In practice, there could be many paths between the transmitter and the receiver. So we will need some kind of uh, uh, two-way communication to really find where the angle of the other we, will, we will talk about that in, in, in detail later. Yes. So this is just the, the raw measurement, right? Estimating angles and distances. All right. So now things will become a little bit mathematical. It's good it's still early in the morning, so we can manage. Okay. So a tool very often used in, in positioning is Fisher information <laughs> and the Kramer rail bound. Okay, and I, now I understand many of you have seen this already, but let's go over this a little bit more detail now. So Fisher information is used in the following context. So you want to estimate something unknown, x. So x could be a distance, but x could also be a position. x could also be a channel from an observation. Z. Z could be a waveform. Z could be a distance estimate from which you want to determine a position. And you have some statistical model. Okay, so how the observation relates to the unknown. Okay, so for people working in communication, H is your channel, Z is your received waveform, and this is your likelihood function. So nothing very special. Okay, with, with this scenario here, under some technical conditions, we can associate the so-called Fisher information matrix. So if X is a two-dimensional position, the Fisher information matrix will be a two-by-two two matrix, given by this expression. Okay, so this maybe looks a little bit complicated, but it involves the likelihood function here. You take the logarithm, take some derivatives, and then you take the expectation with respect to the noise. Okay, and that principle, you can do this, and you find a matrix, which is the... Fisher information matrix. We'll see many examples of this. Okay. Loosely speaking, what it tells you, it tells you the amount of information the observation carries about the unknown in some average sense. Okay, so it's different from, say, Shannon information, which is a scalar concept. Fisher information is a matrix. Right? But you can loosely say that uh, the higher the entries in this matrix, the better you can estimate the parameter. And the more, I would say, diagonal this matrix is, the, the more uncoupled the estimation of these parameters is. Okay. This will give you some intuition. Okay. Why do we care about Fisher information? We care about this because it relates to the error covariance of certain types of estimators. Okay. So you can show that, under some technical conditions, the inverse of this Fisher information matrix is a lower bound, in a positive semi-definite sense, of the error covariance of unbiased estimators. Okay. So this means that if I give you an estimation problem, positioning problem, you each develop your own estimator, right? And I derive the Fisher information matrix. Nobody can do better than the Fisher information matrix in this sense. Okay. So it's a, 
non-trivial lower bound. It's non-trivial because I could put also zero. There's a, a, low, a trivial lower bound. It doesn't carry inf any information. So why is this useful? This is useful because typically it's quite easy to determine fresh information before even developing estimators. Okay, and the fresh information tells you something, okay, this is the best I can achieve, and then you start developing estimators. If you're close to this bound, then you have something very good. There's no point to work harder. Okay, and then you should try to reduce complexity and not stray away too far away from the bound. Okay. Uh, fish information is also very useful in designs. Okay, we will see that for positioning, for instance, the fish information will depend on where I put reference stations. Okay, I can put reference stations in very bad or very good configurations, and the fish information will tell me that before I ever developed any algorithm. Now, if I take the trace of both sides, then I just have a simple metric on the uh, mean square error. Okay, so the mean square error is lower bounded by the trace of the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. It is important to point out that the Fisher information matrix depends on the unknown in general. Okay, so Fisher information depends on the value of the unknown. If I think about position, the Fisher information here will be different from the Fisher information here. There are many variations of the Fisher information matrix and the Cramerio bound. This is the plain vanilla case of Fisher information matrix, okay, where we have a deterministic unknown. Okay, you have other cases where you consider it's random, you can have nuisance parameters, many variations of this. I use this one because typically it gives the most deep insight. The other ones are much harder to compute as well. So this is the, the version of Fisher information that I can typically derive in closed form. So then I can do some subsequent analysis. In the Bayesian case, in many cases, it's much harder to have a closed form expression. The principle is an average over the unknown as well if you have a probability distribution. Right? I can average this expression over the unknown. Oh, if you have the probability distribution. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I can average this over the x, and then I would have also a lower bound, yes. Okay. But there, there's many tricks you can play with this. Question there. Yeah, uh, unbiased means that in expectation your estimate is correct. Right. So this means that okay, so suppose there's an unknown x. This is the true value x, which I do not know. Right? And then I start estimating I over and over and over again, and I make a histogram of the estimates. If my histogram of the estimates is like this, it's biased. Okay, because the mean is different from x. If my histogram of my estimates is like this, then it's an unbiased estimator. Okay. So the, the expectation falls exactly on x. It's a technical condition that I include here. Uh, there's variations of Fisher information that don't need this. No, not always, no. Most estimators are in fact, are in fact biased. Many good estimators are biased. Okay. But I don't want to go into too much detail there. Maybe one additional question to this. If we go with biased estimators, will we be able to, uh, to, uh, to have a better, I mean, to go even below official Yes, yes. Okay. So. All right. So more slightly advanced topics related to fish information. In many cases, uh, you have many unknown parameters. So for instance, in a when you're doing positioning, you uh, based on, say, a channel. No, let's, let's do another problem. Um, let's say you do in communication, and you want to estimate your channel. Right? But instead of just having the channel, you also have maybe a frequency error and a symbol synchronization uh, variable that you need to estimate. So you have m multiple parameters to estimate, but you really only care about the channel. Okay, because the channels may be what, we, what you will use for resource allocation. Okay. So in practice, you could have multiple parameters. So let's break them up here into two. You have x1 and x2 you want to estimate, 
but x1 is the one you really care about, and x2 is just a nuisance parameter. It's unknown, we need to deal with it, but you don't really care about this very much. Okay. So in that case, my fish information matrix will be a quite big <coughs> matrix in general, which will be structured <coughs> like this. Okay, so there's a part related to x1, a part related to x2, and then a cross term, okay, if, the, if the parameters are coupled somehow. And I really care about the uh, parts associated with x1. Okay, so how well can I estimate x1? If I just look at A, A itself is not a good measure of how well I can estimate x1. Because A tells me how well I can <coughs> estimate x1 if x2 is known. So that's not what I want. Okay, I want to tell how well can I estimate x1 if x2 is unknown. Okay, so what I really want to do is I want to invert this big matrix and then look at the upper left block. Okay, that's what I care about in terms of how well can I estimate x1. Okay, so I want to invert this big matrix and I care about this block. But this is not a Fisher information, it's an inverse of Fisher information. Or you can compute something called the equivalent Fisher information of x1, okay, which is given by the inverse of this block. Okay, so I take the big Fisher information matrix, I invert it, okay, and this is what I would use to compute my bounds. Okay, I care about this block, Okay, I just extract this block and I invert it again and it turns out that this inverse is again in the information domain is given by this. And this follows directly from Schur's complement. Uh, the meaning of this expression here is that the Fish information, the equivalent Fish information of x1 in the presence of a nuisance parameter x2 is A. A is the Fish information of x1 if x2 is known. Okay. Minus, and then I have to remove some information because x2 is unknown. Okay, so overall I get less information, so I will have a higher error when I estimate the parameter. So this is equivalent Fisher information. So this is, this is basically the, the error of covariance matrix of x1 known is x1. Okay, A is the, will tell me if I invert A, okay, this will tell me something about the error covariance of x1 if x2 were known. If I invert G. Uh, J E of X1. This tells me something about the error covariance of X1 when X2 is unknown. That's the interpretation here. All right. Now, in general, this expression is a little bit involved. It turns out that when you have a case with a Gaussian additive noise and a linear, um, an observation that's nonlinear in your unknown, okay, so this would be this case. So this is a complex observation of a possibly complex variable with here a mapping and Gaussian noise and this Gauss here is, is, is this Gaussian noise is complex Gaussian noise this means that this notation means that the real and imaginary part of this noise are independent and have the same covariance matrix sigma in that case I can express the Fisher information matrix as a simple function of the derivative of this mean function okay. so here I just have the mean function I take the derivative I put in the inverse of the covariance matrix, take some real part, and I have my fish information matrix. So this is much, much more simple to compute than going through all this work here. Okay. It's quite funny. Many papers, they forget about this expression, and they, they work with this. And it takes two pages of derivation, but it would be half a page with this. Anyway. Okay, so these are concepts that we'll use a lot. So if you have any questions about this. No? We'll do. Um, well, the, the, I cannot offer very much, but I can say the following. So the, the log likelihood function is typically the object that you would use to estimate the parameter. Right. So you would say <coughs> x hat of z is arg max over all x log p z given x. Maximum likelihood estimation, okay? So the log likelihood function as a function of x would have some shape maybe like this, okay? And I want to find the maximum, okay? Now, which, what will give me a better estimation? When the log likelihood function looks like this or when it looks like this? The first case will give me better estimation because I have more, more peaky, right? This will be given a better estimation still. Okay. So somehow the curvature, curvature of this function tells me something about information. 
And the curvature is exactly what this captures. Okay, so you can also write this as a function of second derivative, so it's a curvature in a high dimensional space of this log likelihood function. All right, so let's do a few examples on delay estimation, angle of arrival estimation, angle of departure estimation. And then we'll, we will stop with Kramer hill bounds for some time. Okay, so suppose you want to do delay estimation, <coughs> and since you, you are communication people, I will work with OFDM. Um, okay, so there's an OFDM system with n subcarriers. I transmit on all of the subcarriers a known symbol. Okay, so everything here will be with pilots. I never assume I send any data. Okay, so on all of the subcarriers, I send a known symbol. On the, each of the subcarriers, what I would receive is something with an unknown phase. And then here, a vector which depends on the delay and the subcarrier index. Okay, so this here is the Hadamard product. So on the subcarrier K, I would receive something that depends on the phase, this entry here, and the K transmitted symbol, so the symbol on the K subcarrier, plus NK, the noise on the K subcarrier. Okay. So this is a simple model of including delay in the frequency domain. And now my problem is I want to estimate this phase psi and the delay tau. Is everybody okay with this model, more or less? Because I don't include the channel. I mean, the only effect of the channel is here, this phase the rotation. The here is line of sight, and A is not uh, the array manifold. It's whatever that is. It looks like the array manifold vector. No, no, yeah, it's not an array manifold vector. It's just how the delay transmits, translates to each frequency bin. Right, because... It's like Vandermont vector. Yes. yes. Okay. It's also Vandermont vector in this case, yes. Okay. So if you go a delay in time domain, would translate to this in the frequency domain. So I want to estimate psi and tau. So the key assumption is that within each subcarrier, it's really phase frequency flat, so there's a single tap. Yeah, there, I mean, there, there's no dispersive channel here at all, right? Yeah. So my, my channel, if I were to write it, would just be e to the power j psi delta t minus tau. That's something that what I over which I propagate. All right, so let's go through these motions. The mean function is just this guy, this is the mean function. I need to take the derivative with respect to tau and psi. If I take the derivative with respect to tau, okay, I th here it appears tau, I, I get this uh, a dot, and it's given by this expression, okay, because I have an exponential, so I need to pull it out, remove tau, and then oh, I still have the exponential left over, so I still have my a again. Okay. Um, derivative with respect to psi, okay, I just have the j that I pull in front, and that's it. And now from this, I take uh, this vector, its complex conjugate, uh, the product of the two, outer product, and I get a matrix. Matrix will look like this. Okay. And this follows uh, after some, some very simple derivations. Okay. So I get something here which relates to the subcarrier index, uh, and the index itself squared, the transmitted symbol on that subcarrier index. So this is the part of the Fish information matrix related to tau. I have a part of the Fish information related to psi and a cross term. From this, I can then uh, determine the equivalent fish information of tau, and it would look like this. So it's just this guy minus inverse of this times the product of those two. Okay, so this is the first diagonal element, inverse of the second diagonal element, minus the product of those two. Okay. All right, so it turns out that um, I can try to now design a system to improve my equivalent fish information for tau. Because I want, if I want to do distance estimation, I care about timing estimation. So I want to make this as large as possible. Okay, one way to do this would be to, first of all, uh, try to make Ts, which is the, the reciprocal of my bandwidth, uh, as small as possible. So basically, more bandwidth helps you into, uh, in terms of estimating delays and thus estimating distances. But it makes sense, right? So the, the the more bandwidth I have, in principle, the shorter pulses I could send, so the, the finer I can estimate my delay. Um, also, SNR, I should have high SNR to have good delay estimation, so I want the sigma to be small. Uh, what else? Here, this tells me something about um, the subcarriers and the energy I spent on each of these subcarriers. So if I want to have good delay estimation, what I should do is I should spend all my energy on the boundaries. It doesn't make sense to have a lot of energy in the DC component. I should put most of my energy in the boundaries, my boundary subcarriers, the one that correspond to the higher frequencies. Okay. Because th this summation here, <coughs> uh, 
this k goes from minus the smallest subcarrier, so let's say n over 2, to plus n over 2, k squared. Okay, so if I want to maximize this, I want to put all my energy on those subcarriers where k is large. Right? Makes no sense to put anything on the zero carrier. Kay. Question. That follows from, from this one, right? Okay, so this is the sure complement. Yes, but why, why is it that this sure complement is, is giving us the, the, the artificial information matrix of, uh, of, uh, of the first? Because this is the part related to tau. Okay. This because this first entry is the one that takes the derivative with respect to tau. Okay, so this is the, co the part tau tau. Okay. This is the part psi psi, and this is the cross term. If I want to take the equivalent Fisher information from psi, I will take the sure complement with respect to this block. Okay. So you, you order them as you want, and then you can do the sure complements. All right. You can do the same thing for angle of arrival estimation. Okay. I will just do this uh, briefly. So this is my observation here. I have an unknown phase again. I transmit one complex number from a single antenna device, and I receive on a multi-antenna device, so this is the, the received signal across the antennas of the multi-antenna device, depends on the unknown angle of arrival and the unknown phase. Okay? I actually need to include this unknown phase in all these derivations, because otherwise I cannot put one here. Okay? That allows me to put this arbitrary one here. Okay, so again, I have the mean function. The mean function looks like this. I take derivative with respect to theta, this gives me this part. I take derivative with respect to psi, that gives me this part. Okay. Now this is here a matrix. Okay. I take the outer product, I get a 2 by 2 matrix, so it looks something like this. Okay. This is all very mechanical now at this stage. Uh, it turns out I can do lots of closed form expressions because these, all these uh, vectors and matrices have lots of structure. I will find something like this. Okay. So this is the Fisher information matrix of the angle of arrival and the unknown carrier phase, which is this 2 by 2 matrix. I can then compute the equivalent Fisher information matrix of the angle of arrival. Okay, and it turns out you could compress the, the expression to something like this. Okay, so you have something that depends on the SNR. It depends on the actual angle of arrival. So some angles are easier to estimate than others. And it scales as the uh, cubically in the number of receive antennas which is actually very nice. So it's, uh, it's <coughs> typically quite easy to estimate angles of arrivals with enough antennas. I will spare you the... Okay, question. One question. But, uh, uh, we, I mean, this is for a uniformly linear array. Yes. Right? So perhaps another type of array would be simple to estimate all directions. Or like the directions are hard to estimate. Yes. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure, yes. So typically along the end fire of the array, it's very hard to estimate <coughs> the angles. Okay. How sensitive is this to the precise positioning of the array? Uh, because this is depending on really on the geometry, right? So it's yes. <coughs> well, uh, I think you need to ca calibrate all this, right? So uh, as long as you know where all your elements are, yeah, a priori, a priori yeah. that then it should be fine. Otherwise, this is an additional. So it will not be a regular sum. It will be something else in that case. Yeah. I mean, you can still compute the Fisher information, but maybe you will not have such a nice expression yet. OK. I will not do go through the derivation for angle of departure. Um, just because it's tedious, but uh, it turns out that for angle of departure, the expressions are not very nice. Um, it turns out you actually need to do multiple transmissions to estimate angle of departure. So multiple transmissions from a single, no, from a multiple antenna device towards a single antenna device. Um, there's no obvious scaling here. Okay. So it really depends on the kind of signals that you're sending, whether you beam towards the device or not. So uh, in general, angle of departure estimation is quite a bit harder than angle of arrival estimation. So you have the, if you have the choice, try to do angle of arrival estimation. All right, so these are uh, Cremerio bounds, official information for estimating the, the parameters from the waveform, angles and delays. You can do the same for estimating the position. Right? 
So in this case, we assume that we have, let's say, a single mobile device and a bunch of reference stations. And I've done some kind of protocol to estimate the distances with respect to each of these reference stations. Okay, so I've done two-way time of arrival estimation with each of these reference stations. I have a distance estimate with each of these reference stations. So <coughs> my measurements look like this. Okay, so I'm x, I have an unknown position x. There's reference stations with known position xm, and I take distance estimates through some protocol with Gaussian noise. Okay. From this, I can again compute the Fisher information matrix. So it, it involves the derivative of this with respect to x. Okay. This will be a vector. So this is a unit length vector pointing between myself and the reference station. From that, I can compute the Fisher information matrix. Okay, so the, it turns out the Fisher information matrix is a two by two matrix. It uh, involves a sum over all the reference stations. So all the reference stations bring me independent information. Each reference station brings information that's weighed by the precision of the measurement. Okay, so th the better I can estimate distances, the more information I get. And then with each uh, <coughs> reference station, I get a rank one two by two matrix, which is related to the direction. So if I want to have good position, I want to ma make this matrix full rank, I should have estimates from different directions. Okay? And in the GPS community, this is called as GDOP, geometric dilution of precision. All right, so now I can look at this guy, take its inverse, take its trace, and if I take the square root of this, this is something called the position error bound, which is often used in the positioning community. So the position error bound is a measure of how well I can estimate a position expressed in meters. So one meter, two meter, three meters, uncertainty. And I can visualize this. Okay? So then I would get something like this. So I have here three reference stations. Okay? I do time of arrival estimation with each of these reference stations. I then determine a position fix. And this here tells me my, the position error bound as a function of space. So the way to interpret this, I compute this guy here for a certain x. Let's say here. And it gives me a number expressed in meters. And then I, I visualize this number in a color and I trace across the map. Okay. So what I can tell here, for instance, is that if I'm roughly inside of the convex hull of the reference stations, I can estimate my position really well. If I move outside of this convex hull, I will have a somehow graceful degradation and at some point I will be in very bad shape. Okay. I cannot estimate my position very well. Okay. And these kind of figures are very helpful if you want to determine where to place your reference stations. Okay. By, by moving these reference stations, these colors will change. You can have better and worse performance in some areas. I'll spend a few more minutes now on the algorithms. So now we know a little bit about how to estimate parameters and what are the fundamental performance bounds for both for estimating those parameters and for doing the positioning. The next step is develop algorithms. Right? <coughs> so the typical algorithms that you would try to do are these. So if you want to estimate your position x based on a number of measurements, typically nonlinear in x, uh, you would probably start with least squares. Okay? So try to minimize the error with, of the, with respect to the observation. You can also do maximum likelihood, okay? a little bit more complicated, or maximum a posteriori. And I assume everybody is familiar with, with these techniques. The problem is that these are generally not convex problems. Okay, so there's lots of local optima. So to give you an example, uh, here I show for a specific case of angle of arrival or angle of departure estimation what the, the log likelihood function looks like. Okay, so these are the, the, the trial values that I will search over to figure out my angle of arrival or angle of departure. And here I'm plotting the log likelihood function. In blue is the log likelihood function for angle of departure and in red for angle of arrival. So they have a nice peak around the true value. But of course, if you do some, let's say, graded ascent and you start from here, uh, you will end up here. Okay, so you'll be in deep trouble. So it's highly non-convex problems. Pretty nasty. Of course, if you have some prior information of the angle that tells you, OK, I should search around here, you can do much better. So how do we localize devices? Um, let me see. I will think I will skip this one. OK, so this is the uh, least square, no, the maximum likelihood cost function for a positioning problem. OK, so I have three reference nodes. I determine distance estimates. This is my true position. And this is the uh, maximum likelihood objective function. OK, so here in this case, there's a nice global optimum around the true position. But there could be some local, local optima as well. When I put more and more reference stations, there'll be more and more local optima. So the problem gets a little bit harder. 
All right, so how do you solve these kind of problems? Uh, one way to, okay, something went wrong here. One way would be to use a gradient uh, a, a ascent algorithm. So this here is my measurement. This will be my least squares cost function. And I would start from some guess and then slowly try, slowly try to improve this guess by using the gradient. Okay. So I move slowly up the gradient to end up in a local optimum. Okay. I don't have much time to go here. You need an initial estimate to do this. And as you've seen, if your initial <coughs> estimate is far away from the true value, you will end up in a bad local optimum. So how do you deal with that? Um, so there's a lot of work in uh, convexifying this problem. So I can write the maximum likelihood positioning problem in this form. Okay. So I have distance estimates. I want to tr try to find the position x such that I minimize the error with respect to the distance estimate. And here I have a measure of this error. So these are two reformulations of the maximum likelihood problem. Okay. So maybe this one is more intuitive. This is my x that I try to find. This is my distance measurement. This is a, a metric of the error. And I try to minimize the sum of these metrics. So this is quite clearly related to the least squares problem. Okay. This is a little bit less obvious. The problem with all these formulations are these constraints. So these are nonlinear equality constraints. Okay. Because I want to be on circles, right? And then you can try to uh, relax these constraints. So instead of saying, I want to be on a circle, you can say, I want to be inside of a disk. And disks are nice because disks are convex objects. Okay. So by relaxing constraints in this way, you end up with uh, convex optimization problems. In this case, by relaxing circles to disks, you find uh, an SOCP, second order comb program. There's also versions of SDP. Um, these, these, when you solve these, and this can be done quite efficiently, you will end up with a good estimate, but maybe not your maximum likelihood one. But then you can use this good estimate as an input to your least squares gradient descent solver. Okay. So this is typically how, how these things are solved. You first convexify, find a good initial guess. Okay, it's time to stop. <laughs> and then uh, you use this initial estimate in a least square solver. Do you, look to, do, you, do you use it to move ac across the circles afterwards? After maybe you find the point in the convex which, region which is not in the circle, and then you move to the yes. point. And yes. <coughs> Um, ta -ta -ta -ta. Okay, I just want to spend one more slide on uh, mobility and then we we'll take a break. So everything here now was on a static estimation. Okay, I have measurements, I stand still, I collect measurements, I determine my position and I'm done. In practice, everything is moving. And for this, you would use tracking mechanisms, tracking filters. Okay, so the, the model that we use in those cases, and I, I guess many of you have seen this, is you have a mobility model that tells you how you're moving, even in the absence of measurements. And then you have a measurement model, which uh, you collect measurements every now and again. And then you would run a Bayesian filter. Okay, Bayesian filter works more or less like this. Uh, you have some prior knowledge of where you are. You, through your mobility model, you can predict where you're going and where your uncertainty will be. Then you collect a measurement. And this measurement will shrink your distribution closer to where you are with less uncertainty. And then you repeat this. You move, you increase your distribution, you measure, you shrink your distribution. So uh, typical techniques that people use in the, in the positioning literature are the extended Kalman filter. We rarely use the, the, the standard Kalman filter because our measurements are always nonlinear in the state. A distance measurement is not linear in the state, not linear in the position. Uh, also very common is the particle filter. I have slides on this, but I will skip them uh, for time reasons. But you, you can look at them later when we upload them. So now it's time to uh, switch from the, the general uh, concepts of radio-based positioning to 5G. So if you think about the evolution of radio-based positioning, uh, there's a, a large number of technologies available. So in fact, positioning has been available in the second generation of cellular communication using uplink cell ID information. So just based on which base station you connect to, you have some very rough indication of where you are. Okay, and this, 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 the position is computed by the base station. In, two and in 3 and 4G, uh, measurements were switched from just cell ID to time difference of arrival. So the mobile would broadcast a signal, and the synchronized base stations would estimate time of arrival, then compute time difference of arrival, and then determine the position of the user. Okay. But typically, you would have not very good accuracy. GPS is another technology which uses downlink time of arrival and can give you good accuracy in, in nice conditions. Right? This means when you have visibility from enough satellites, when you're not in an urban canyon or indoors or under, tree, under a tree canopy. 
I ha also have here on the uh, x axis, on the y axis, a measure of cost. So cost could be power consumption of overhead. I, I leave it kind of open. But in general, uh, GPS is more <coughs> costly than localization with cellular uh, because you need additional hardware, additional processing. Uh, you can also do Wi-Fi based positioning with fingerprinting, typically fused with other sensors. And you can get, get quite good accuracy provided that you've, uh, you've done a good survey of your environment and then use this as a database and then determine your position. But again, this comes at a higher cost. This cost now would be in collecting the measurements and redoing them periodically to have a good, uh, good radio map. Another technology is ultra-wideband. I haven't talked very much about ultra-wideband. Ultra-wideband is basically a position technology using very short pulses, sub-nanosecond pulses. And based on those, devices can estimate distances very accurately. So maybe down to a few centimeters, but very costly. Okay, you need dedicated hardware again. So there's this trend. Right. And what I and many people in the positioning community believe is that uh, 5G could possibly break this trend. Okay, so 5G could work with very high accuracy, with relatively low cost. And it would be in low cost because it would just piggyback on the communication. Okay, so the communication system and infrastructure will be there, and we just use the signals that are there to do the positioning of the devices. And hopefully in the, next you'll, uh, in the next two hours, I can convince you of this. So when I talk about 5G, I mean the following. Okay, so different people have talked about different concepts, but this is what I would call 5G here. So in 5G, we will likely have large antenna arrays. Okay. Definitely at base stations, possibly also at the mobile devices, depending on the frequencies at which we operate. We would have large available bandwidth. So for 5G, two bands are, will be allocated. One is below 6 gigahertz, and the second band above uh, 28 gigahertz. So these two bands will be available at the same time. When you say a large array, do you refer to the number of antennas, the aperture, or? A number of antennas here, yes. OK, so we'll have large bandwidths available. And possibly, in the millimeter wave, we'll also go to high carrier frequencies. Uh, there will also be device-to-device -device communication using side links. Okay, so these are devices communicating to each other uh, under the control of a base station. We'll also have network densification, lots and lots of base stations of, of different uh, categories. Okay, so I guess these are not very controversial, but now I would argue that these are all actually very good for positioning. Okay, so uh, in the next few slides, uh, I will give my opinion of why high carrier frequencies are good, why large bandwidths are good, why having lots of antennas are good, why device to device communication is good for positioning, and why having a dense network is also good for positioning. So I will go through all of these one by one. Okay, so high carrier frequencies. Why, why do we like high carrier frequencies? So if you think about the channel matrix in the below six gigahertz band, uh, the typical model would be to populate this matrix with IID entries from a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that you have very little related to the propagation environment. When you move to millimeter wave, as we've seen yesterday, the propagation channel becomes much more closely tied to the propagation environment. So there could be a line of sight component, and then you would have scattering from reflecting surfaces coming from, from a few discrete angles. Okay. So you would have basically a few <coughs> paths, okay, where each path here corresponds to a cluster with a certain gain. You would have angle of arrival, angle of departures, and delays. So this is when you shift from sub-6 gigahertz to above 28 gigahertz, is that your channel properties change. Okay. And they become closely tied to the environment. Okay. I will not spend much time because we've seen a lot of this yesterday. <coughs> large bandwidths. Why are large bandwidths good? Okay. So we know now from fissure information that having a large bandwidth is good because it increases your fissure information. It increases your effective fissure information of delay estimation so it's good for distance estimation because delays can be connected to distances. So that's one thing. The other thing is when you have um, higher bandwidth, you can resolve the multi-path delays. Okay? So in a low bandwidth, two paths would basically look as one path when they're not resolvable, when their difference in distance is too small. With very high bandwidth, we can resolve many of the paths. So this here is a figure uh, from an experimental campaign in uh, Austria. At a 2 gigahertz bandwidth, when a device is moving with respect to a fixed transmitter, and basically here on the, the x-axis are the impulse responses, or the power delay profiles. 
Okay, so you see first the line of sight with a high power, and this line of sight path can be connected to the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. But you also see a lot of very strong multipath components. Okay? And because of this high bandwidth, you can resolve these and you can track them. Okay, so you know where the multipath is in terms of the distance. Okay, there's a lot of also diffuse multipath, which basically acts as a background noise. Okay, so large bandwidths are good because they allow for accurate delay estimation and thus accurate distance estimation and a high degree of resolvability of the multipath. Okay, so high carrier frequencies are good, large bandwidths are good. Large number of antennas, also good. Okay, so we've again seen from fish information, for instance, for angle of arrival estimation, the more antennas you have, the more you can, the better you can estimate a single angle of arrival, just like a delay. Um, also, by having more antennas, you have a higher resolvability. Okay, so this here is uh, the response seen at a multi-antenna receiver when there's two distinct paths from different angles. If I have very few antennas, here are eight antennas, they will be lumped together. I cannot resolve them. But when I put more and more antennas, I can start resolving the two paths with their distinct angle of arrival. Okay? So it's the same story as delay. Okay, so more antennas is good just because you can do better estimation of a single angle, but you can also resolve multiple angles. Okay, so this is why a large number of antennas is good. Device-to-device -device communication, also pretty good. So why is device-to-device -device communication good? Suppose you have this scenario here where this device cannot communicate directly to a base station, but maybe it can communicate with another device. Okay. In that case, they can exchange information. They can, for instance, do distance estimation with respect to each other. Okay. And it is known from the literature of cooperative localization that that can bring down your error. Okay. Because you have much more information in your system, so it will bring down your localization error. It also increases your coverage. So you could be localized now with device to device where you could not be localized without device to device. Okay, so device to device communication is good for positioning. What else do we have? Network densification. So when we put lots and lots of uh, base stations everywhere, there's a higher chance of having a line of sight connection. Okay, I think this is maybe a little bit debatable, but uh, I will make this assumption that there will be more chance of line of sight compared to in the past, where you rely more on diffraction. And line of sight is good for positioning, right? Because the line of sight link tells you something directly about the distance, <coughs> tells you something about angle of arrival, angle of departure between the two devices that are communicating. Okay, so line of sight is good, so this means that network densification is also good. Okay. So of course, uh, these are five properties, and they all aggregate, right? So e each one of them is good for positioning, but together, they're very good for positioning. So all in all, 5G, I think, is a unique technology that provides a lot of opportunities for positioning. All right, so, uh, question. Are there any downsides of 5G? Are there downsides of 5G? Well, well heresy. Uh, I think there's lots of technological challenges to be solved. As we will see uh, with 5G, we can expect to not just estimate the position of devices, but orientation. Uh, so this requires lots of calibration of angles and also delay synchronization issues that need to be solved. So from a mathematical point of view, there's promises, but from a technological point of view, there's many challenges. No, so we, I, don't, I don't consider polarization here. Yes, there, there will be more multipath, of course. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. yeah, so there will be more resolvable path to be yeah, th that you will see. Yes, of course. Yes, but we'll talk about that. Yes. So you have multiple antennas. I suppose you will not uh, apply ULA or you have uh, planar antenna array. Yes, in, in practice, yeah, you would How use pl planar arrays. I'm, I'm, uh, that I don't. Okay, that I have not considered, sorry. All right, so th there's uh, basically uh, two tracks of research going on now in 5G positioning. One in uh, sub, six, sub 6 gigahertz and one above 28 gigahertz. So uh, what I will try to do now is provide uh, a little bit of a literature overview of what's been going on recently. 
Okay, so if we go below six gigahertz, we have uh, many of the nice properties we want, but maybe we don't have the high carrier frequencies. Right? So we, ha we will have, um, basically in the delay domain, the paths are not very well resolvable. Okay, but in the angle domain, they could be. Okay, so many paths, uh, weaker connection to the environment in general. Okay, so th the problem that people are considering is more or less the following. We consider a single device um, transmitting uplink pilot signals to multiple base stations. The single device has a certain unknown position, the user position, and an unknown clock offset. It sends signals to a certain base station, and this will be the signal received at a certain base station across all of its antennas. Okay, so the signal depends on uh, multiple paths arriving from different directions with different delays. So each path is associated with a complex gain, an angle of arrival, and a delay. And then, of course, there's noise. We will have multiple of these signals seen by multiple base stations. And then the goal is for the cellular system to localize the user. So because we don't have a very, um, because we don't work at these very high carrier frequencies, it's, uh, the, the paths will typically lump together in the delay domain, but they could be resolvable in the angle domain if we have enough antennas. And that's what, what most of these works are based on. Okay, so this could be the, the kind of picture that, to, that shows what we're doing. So there's a device moving around here, a base station with multiple antennas, many paths arriving from the device to the base station, and then the base, the base station estimates uh, maybe the distance, but definitely the angle towards the user. That will be the goal. Any questions about the model here? Okay. All right, so there's been two works that I'm aware of in this area. One is under single path propagation. Okay, so the, the first work that I will consider is where they have a user at multiple base stations, and they only consider those base stations that are in line of sight. Okay, so we do not consider any base stations that do not have a line of sight. So then the model will be something like this in this uh, work I consider here. So you have a user with an unknown clock offset and a time varying position. So the user is moving. We have an OFDM system where at a certain, okay, now I should point out there's two notions of time here. So there's the notion of time at which I transmit data. So I'm sending symbols one after the other. That's one notion of time. There's another notion of time at which the mobility happens. So that's a much longer time scale. Okay. So the index T here corresponds to this mobility. Okay, so how, how this happens at the maybe 100 milliseconds or one second level. Okay. So at a certain discrete time, at a certain base station, at a certain subcarrier, I will have an observation. This observation depends on a complex gain. There's only one now because I assume line of sight, uh, an angle of arrival, a delay, a pilot sequence, and noise. Okay, so I assume that I'm sending a sequence of pilot symbols on each of the subcarriers, and then on one subcarrier for one base station across the array, I would get something like this. And the angle of arrival can be related to the position of the user, and the delay can also relate to the position of the user, also accounting for the clock offset. Okay, so this is the mathematical model that the observ of the observation of a certain base station. Okay. Uh, we can aggregate over all of the subcarriers and then vectorize, and we will get a model that's somehow reminiscent of what we had yesterday. So across all the subcarriers at base station K, at a certain discrete time T, we would have a very long vector here, considering the gain, considering the transmitted symbols across all of the pilots, and then a vector here that contains the angle of arrival and the delay, plus noise. Okay. It's just a, a linear equation because, of course, everything is linear. But this B depends on a nonlinear way on the angle of arrival and delay, just as we've seen before. Okay, and I will have this, this uh, Kronecker product here because of the two parameters. Okay, so I have a very long observation and also a, a long vector here that relates to the angle of arrival and the delay. All right, so the solution strategy and, and the work that I'm considering here um, was the following. So you have a global state of the user, okay, which has a ST with position X of T and a clock offset, which is also modeled to be time varying here. So it could be very slowly varying over time. You pose a dynamic model. So this model tells you how the state evolves over time. Okay, so the state, including the position and the clock offset, 
at time t is related to the previous state through a matrix f with noise. So based on a general mobility of the user, you could pose such a model. Secondly, at some times, we'll have observations. Okay, so the observations depend on a nonlinear way on the state plus the noise. Once we have this model and we've decided on a good observation here, we can run an extended Kalman filter. Okay. Now the question is, uh, what is a good observation to choose? So as we've seen in the, as we've seen in the first part, um, you have different levels of observations, right? You could work with angles and time estimates. You could work directly with distance estimates and process those to get distances. So one way to proceed will be the following. So you, can, you aggregate all the observations from all of the base stations. You create this huge vector, okay? And I can call this Y of T. This huge vector is sent to a fusion center, which runs a Kalman filter. The, to track the position and the clock offset of the user. Okay, th this is probably not a, a very elegant way of solving this problem, right? Because you have this huge dimensional observation. What you could do is something more simple, which is that you send low dimensional observations from the base station and that are fused here. So what is a good local measurement that you could do at each base station? Each base station could in principle estimate or track the time of arrival and the angle of arrival from, its, from the user. Okay. You track these parameters, you send these estimates to the fusion center, and then the fusion center tracks the user, and the user uh, position and clock offset. So this is what this paper does. Um, so you have a local model at each of the base stations and then a global model in the fusion center. Okay, so locally at each base station, you run an extended Kalman filter. The, at each base station, you would have thus a local model, which tells you how the local state evolves. So the local state at base station K is the time of arrival and the angle of arrival. Okay, we have a dynamic model of how these evolve. Okay, you can have some reasonable model for this, based on the mobility of the user, and a local measurement equation. Okay, and this local measurement equation depends just on the local observation at that base station. Okay, so. Again, what you do, the base station sends, oh sorry, the user sends in uplink a training sequence. Each base station est uh, receives this training sequence across all of its subcarriers and across all of its antennas. Runs a local Kalman filter to track time of arrival and angle of arrival. <laughs> sends these estimates to a global Kalman filter, which tracks the position and the clock offset of the user. And this is very closely related to what people are doing right now in, in LTE for time difference of arrival, the only extra thing is that we add the angle information. <coughs> one, one question. I mean, yes. I mean, how do you get the, the parameters of the state? You know, the F, the H, and your equation. Um, so that you have a mobility of model of the user. Right, so you know where all the base stations are, and if you know something about how the user typically moves, you can have a predictive model <coughs> of, of uh, each of these parameters. Because it's a time delay, is related to distance, and if you know how the user moves, you can have a model for that. Angle is related to the relative position, and you can have a model for that too. Yeah, and as long as your model is sufficiently robust, this will work quite well. Eric. So when you feed your estimate to your Kalman filter, do you also provide some uncertainty? Measure? Yes, okay, so. And where does that come from? Because so you're using ML estimates for the for the angles, if I understood what, so you're taking like the gravitation information or something else? Okay, so the, um, let me first try to say something general and then we can go to your question. So locally, each base station tracks with a Kalman filter, time of arrival and angle of arrival. So locally, each base station has an estimate, a mean and a covariance matrix. And then at each time instant, it sends this mean and covariance matrix to this global Kalman filter. So, so your question is about the local call. Yeah, my field. question was in general how you handle the uncertainty um, measures of your estimates, but I think you answered it. I mean, because you say here you initialize with an ML estimate, but in fact... Yeah, okay, so initialize means when you switch on your yeah. system, okay. at, at the first time step, use an ML estimate with a kind of yeah. broad uncertainty, and then you can start yeah. running your filter. Two 
place for the uh, mobile to know its position. It's either to compute itself its position, like uh, in, uh, in GPS, mm -hmm. uh, GSS in general. And in that case, they are also at the aspect of uh, social uh, aspect, like privacy, etc. Mm -hmm. And already some people call, called a cellular phone's tracking device, mm -hmm. because uh, it can be tracked and know the position roughly. Uh, and then if, if, you, if the mobile uh, uh, computes its position, then, then it will be uh, the only one knowing its exact position, its yes. correct position. Whereas if you let the network uh, compute it, you can uh, okay, you open the door to uh, all, all kinds of, uh, uh, of problems, or yes. etc. Uh, okay, this is the general uh, comment I have yes. to say. Uh, the question is also that uh, in LTE, there are uh, uh, there exist also uh, the uh, uh, positioning uh, reference signals yes. that can be used for accurate position. Uh, do you know any implementation of, uh, of, of, of uh, this, uh, this reference signal? Do you uh, use case whether they are in, uh, in fact used in, uh, nowadays? Well, as I know, one of the main use cases of, of positioning uh, of users from the base station side is emergency call localization. So th that's why they need to provide this. So there's a certain requirement that they need to meet, and so they need to provide enough pilot resources to do the sufficiently accurate positioning. I think that that's the main use case that's been driving this. Yeah. Okay. So this is true, and it really it depends who you talk to, right? For instance, if you talk to Ericsson or Huawei, they want to do the positioning in the uplink from the base station side, and I resell this as a service. Right, and, and it's true, this poses all kinds of privacy considerations. It also depends on what kind of application you have in mind. So there's people thinking, now here in, in Gothenburg, there will be uh, autonomous cars from Volvo driving around in a few months. Once you start connecting these and letting them cooperate, you need in some central unit some kind of information of where all the cars are. Right, so in that case, doing the uplink positioning makes sense as well. It really depends on the application of the business case. But uh, of course, th 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 this is a concern. No? Yes, so that's also considered. Typically, you don't want to tell where the base stations are. Yeah. Yeah, there's also power consumption issues, right? You want to make the base station do the work, not the user. I mean, GPS is very power hungry, for instance. Isn't that a reliability problem for the uplink position? Is there a li reliability <laughs> problem? Hearability, like the SNR, you cannot really reach many base stations. So if you're close to one, yeah. Base station, so you probably need to less power in the other base stations. <coughs> That's true, and I think I will talk about this later. That's why 5G can help, because we believe that one base, and you, one base station, you can do the positioning. You don't need multiple. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, there is some uncertainty in clocks, and so it's, uh, the base may be the frequency changing. Yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, the, the, the worse clocks you have, the, the, the worse your estimation will be, un unless you can accurately track the, the phase offsets and the, the clock skews. But, uh, there is, a, a, is there any way to remove uh, this uncertainty? You can buy a more expensive oscillator, of course. But uh, I mean, the, the, the typically, the localization problem and the synchronization problem are very closely tied together. You cannot do, one, you cannot do localization without doing some form of synchronization. So th this is always taken into consideration when you do localization. Yeah, so different antenna configurations will give you better or worse positioning, or d d better or worse angle of arrival estimation, of course. Yes. I, I and again, I think uh, I see 5G positioning as a way to do positioning, piggybacking on the communication. So we don't say we want this kind of antenna or this kind of signals. We will we'll do our best with what's there to do, to do the positioning. But of course, different configurations will have, have different performance.
All right, so what I talked about today was taken from this work. I mean, uh, most of the works I cover here are very recent. Th th this 5G positioning is a very recent topic. This is from Tampere University in Finland. Um, so th they evaluated this method using UAVs flying around in 3D um, with very precise uh, channel modeling, propagation modeling from, from the METIS project. They used for the positioning always the two closest line of sight base stations. Okay. But in their propagation, there was also a multi-path propagation, so non line of sight paths were there. They were considered a disturbance. Uh, they had base stations with 20 antennas. And uh, the slow time scale, or the T index here, was 100 milliseconds. So every 100 milliseconds, I update my time of arrival, angle of arrival estimates, and my position and clock offset. So unfortunately, the, despite having a very sexy scenario, they had uh, not so very sexy results somehow. Um, <laughs> So this is the local performance at a certain base station. So remember, a certain base station will track time of arrival and angle of arrival. And they try two different filters, the extended Kalman filter and the unscented Kalman filter. And so they're able to estimate uh, azimuth, elevation, and time of arrival, all with very high accuracy. Okay. So if you, for instance, focus on the uh, time of arrival, about uh, approximately one nanosecond. Okay. And recall, one nanosecond is 30 centimeters flight distance. Okay. So you we hope to get maybe not too much worse than 30 centimeter in the positioning. So this is locally at a certain base station. Okay. Now when we go globally at a fusion center which connects from multiple base stations, this is the positioning and uh, clock offset estimation performance. Let's see, I just want to focus I think on the dark blue bars here. They have many results. So on the left is the quality of the positioning in 3D. So the, the root mean square error. On the right is the quality of the clock offset estimation. And you see that with their uh, extended Kalman filter, they go below one meter. Okay. So they're, they're not as good as the timing estimation. They don't reach 30 centimeters because you have multiple sources of uncertainty mixing together. Um, and then globally, they can estimate the clock offset also around roughly one nanosecond. So this is a kind of side product that you can estimate the user's clock offset extremely precisely. And this, in turn, has other applications as well. All right, so this is one application in, a, well, maybe not very massive MIMO, but with large MIMO, um, using bandwidths that are currently available. <coughs> now, here, <coughs> yes, Eric. So, could you comment on how sensitive these Kalma filters are to, I mean, those filters are all based on linearizations of a nonlinear model. Yes. And I haven't played around hands on with extended Kalman filters mm -hmm. since I was a graduate student, but I tend to remember <coughs> that if you have a highly nonlinear model, yes. you get a little bit wrong and you can completely lose Yes. Track. Yes. So could that happen here? I mean, how do you catch that? If, if that happens, how do you catch that? Yeah, so, uh, okay. Or is there a mechanism, or I mean, you could set your covariance to infinity if you discover that the Kalman filter has lost track, but how do you do it in practice in these algorithms? So here, um, okay, so for the Kalman filter itself assumes a, a weakly nonlinear regime. Yeah. Right, so you, you don't have too much nonlinearity, otherwise, as you say, it will fail. Um, I, th I think the unscented Kalman filter that they tried here can deal with more nonlinearities, but here it turned out to, to perform worse. So I think in this case, they didn't have so much problem with, with this. But in, in general, I mean, you have ways of detecting that your estimates and your observations are largely inconsistent, sure. right? And at and, and that point, you should start trusting your measurements more than your, your predictions. Sure. Do you apply that kind of heuristics or that kind of techniques here? Or? Uh, so I don't, okay, uh, th this is not my personal work, so I'm no, presenting, yeah, okay, yes. Right. So I don't know all the things that are under the hood. But typically, what you would do is some kind of gating, right? So yeah. if something yeah. falls outside yeah. of my or yes, so if something falls outside of my three sigma confidence interval, then I don't trust it. And this could go for the prediction or for the measurements. Yeah, but I can I, I don't know all all the the precise details. Okay, so this previous work I talked about considered only the line of sight. So there's also been work considering multiple paths. Okay, so here the observation model is slightly more complicated. Uh, I have a user moving in the environment. I have multiple base stations that see signals from that user. But now the signal just does not just have one path, but multiple paths. So each of the paths at a certain base station 
corresponds to a complex gain, angle of arrival, and a delay. Okay. And then uh, the, the first path, which is the line of sight path, and here I assume that there's line of sight between the user and the base stations, can be related uh, in terms of its angle of arrival and delay to the user position, okay. just as before. Okay, so now the challenge is in the presence of all these paths, can I still estimate the user's position? So in th this work, what they did was to um, take an observation at each base station, correlate with a transmit with a pilot sequence, and then sample. Sample at a time that you try to collect the line of sight path. Okay. So when you sample the waveform, you just get an observation, which is a vector of the size of the number of antennas at that base station. Okay, so at base station K, we have an observation that looks like this. It's a vector, the size of the number of antennas, that tries to capture the line of sight path. Of course, it will capture many other paths, right? Because they all blur together if you don't have enough bandwidth. So for instance, this is here what the base station would see as an observation uh, across all of the angles okay, at a certain time. So there's the line of sight path, but you see all kind of other paths here as well. And this is written here mathematically in this equation. So observation at base station K, there's no notion of time here, just the base station K, is the line of sight path, okay, which depends on the angle of arrival, which depends on the user position, with a complex gain, and then all the non-line of sight paths, which depends on angles that have nothing to do with the user but related to the propagation environment, plus noise. <coughs> Question. We will see how we can differentiate. From a single base station point of view, you cannot differentiate. You just have a bunch of paths. Okay. But of course, if you have multiple base stations that all know their own position, you can try to find paths that are mutually consistent. And that's, that's the, what goes on here. Okay, any question about this model? Okay, so the user sends a long training sequence. Each base station correlates and samples at a time to collect the line of sight path. But of course, it will collect many other paths because they blur together in the delay domain. And then I would get an observation that looks like this. Okay, now my goal is from multiple base stations, can I try to recover the user position? Okay, so as I mentioned before, the key idea here is consistency. So this is the user, multiple base stations, you see here the different paths drawn as lines. They come from different angles. So this base station sees two paths from different angles. And maybe it cannot distinguish which is the user and which is the, the scattering object here. This base station is the same. This base station has one path. This has two paths. But what you can see is that um, the user can be found on the intersection of these four lines. Okay, so because the user position has to be compatible with one path corresponding to each base station. Okay, so if I remove the user and start drawing the lines for each of these paths, this position is consistent in the angle domain with four paths, one from each base station. This position here corresponding to the scattering object is not consistent with four paths. Remember here there's four base stations. Okay, so this means that this position is more likely to be the user position than this position. <coughs> And that's what the method here will try to exploit. And now, of course, in practice, you will have many, many of these scattering objects. All right, so to understand the method, uh, it relies on sparsity and convex optimization. We'll first do two simple cases. Okay, so the first case is where there's only line of sight. So there's no scatterers. There's only the line of sight path, just as in the previous method I discussed. So I have an observation at each base station. There's only the line of sight path, as shown here. Okay. And I want to recover the user position. So what I'm presenting now is a very complicated, unnecessarily complicated method to do this. What we will try to do here is you try many positions. So you make a grid of positions. And for each position, you can then compute the angle of arrival to each of the base stations. And then you will try to minimize the error of a reconstructed observation with respect to the true observation at the base station. Okay. So what we do is we minimize some norm of a vector. This vector now uh, contains entries x. These are here. These represent the complex gains seen from each of the base stations. 
Okay, so we try to find the best complex gains to explain the observation. And we try every possible position that the user could be in our space. Okay, so um, our vector x would be a huge matrix with all the possible positions. Okay, and then here the number of base stations. And we want to find a, a one particular location and put all the channel gains there. Okay, because there's one location that in principle can explain the observation. Okay, so the row here determines the position. And then the entries there determine the gains. And if there's no noise and I'm lucky, I can recover, uh, have a zero error here. And then I know where the user is. And I've also recovered all the complex gains. Now, this is a maybe strange norm. So this is a mixed norm, which induces a row sparsity in this <coughs> matrix. Okay, so the norm is defined like this. So you have an inner L2 norm and an outer L1 norm. Okay. And this creates, uh, prefers matrices for which the rows, which there's a few rows with non-zeros, but within each row you can have many non-zero elements. <coughs> it's a kind of special norm. <coughs> now this problem is a convex optimization problem, so you can solve it with uh, your favorite solver. Right. So the intuition again behind this method is to find the fewest number of locations that can explain the observations at all of the base stations. And this is not a method that you would use to solve this problem if you hadn't seen this, right? It's a hugely complicated method, but it's a method to try to solve this problem for the line of sight case. Okay. Any question about the method? <coughs> all right. So let's do another case, which is also not very meaningful, but it serves as a that together we put them together and we can solve our global problem. Okay, now suppose that there's one base station, okay, and I want to estimate the angle of arrivals that I see. Okay. One way to do this is to take the observation, have an, uh, a variable here to minimize the error, and I consider a whole bunch of different angles, or so a grid of angles for each base station. Okay. So for each base station, I will try to find complex gains that I minimize this error. And I want to find a sparse pattern. Okay, so that means I want to explain the observation with the fewest possible angles that I can. If I can do it with one, it's better than explaining it with two. A again, uh, this is a convex optimization problem. It is not the way that you would solve this problem by itself, but it's a useful building block. Okay? So again, the intuition is to find the fewest number of angles to explain the observation at each of the base stations. So we've seen two methods that use sparsity. One is in the line of sight case. The other one is where well, you just estimate the angles and you don't care about the position. Okay, but now you can start putting them together. Now we get something like this. Okay, so what we will do is we will combine both of these problems. So we have a matrix X and a matrix Y. The matrix X contains all the possible positions that the user could be for each of the <coughs> base stations. The matrix Y tries to explain the, the non-line of side paths. Okay. So we want to find the sparsest possible y, and then this uh, x with this special norm, okay, that we have row sparsity, to explain the observation. So now we decompose the observation in a part related to the position, because these are all the possible positions that we try, the complex gains we associate with this position, and all possible angles that we try, and the complex gains with those. So a possible solution of this problem would be to plug in the true position here, the true gains here, the true angle of arrivals here, and the true uh, gains of those non-line of sight paths there. That would be one solution. Okay, again, this is a convex optimization problem, which tries to explain the observation with the fewest possible positions, fewest possible because of this mixed norm. Okay. And whatever remains, it tries to explain with the fewest possible angles. So this problem, if uh, without this method, would, would actually be hard to solve. So the, the original problem of determining the user and all the angles is a quite hard problem, but this method can solve it. Okay, so convex optimization problem. It involves this trade-off parameter W. And I, as you may know from all these sparsity-based methods, the trade-off parameter plays an important role and is typically quite hard to set. So this trade-off parameter here, W, if we set it very, very small, so if we set it to zero, that means we remove it, that means we try to explain everything with the non-line of side paths. Okay. It would give a solution. If we set it really, really high, oh no, this is wrong. When we set it small, what's here? Is this wrong? 
I said it's right here? Okay, so that, okay, when this is really small, we care about this one. So we try to explain everything with the line of side path. Okay. When it's really large, it's the converse. It turns out for this problem, you can find a closed form expression of, of a range of Ws that are good, that will give you a good recovery. So it turns out that this method, once you implement it, works really, really well compared to many of the existing methods in the literature. So this is for a bandwidth of 30 megahertz and at a quite high SNR. We show that this method provides very good recovery with a very low localization <coughs> error compared to any of the methods that we found in the literature. Okay. And this is a work by the guy who's been doing the explanations here. There. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, th these are the works that I have found in the literature uh, using large uh, antenna arrays for user positioning in the uplink. So this would be something compatible with the massive MIMO concept, right? where you send this uplink training signals, and we, we would just reuse them to do the position estimation. Right. So in summary, in this uh, sub, six sub six gigahertz band, there will be many multipath components that are overlapping in the delay domain, but we can hopefully resolve them in the angle domain by using these large antennas, large antenna arrays. Uh, we need to aggregate information from multiple base stations to do the positioning. So both of these methods did the same thing. You have measurements at each of the base stations, and you combine them to do the position estimation. There are clock offsets of the user that you should always take into account. As I said before, when you're doing localization, you should also do synchronization. <coughs> and it turns out that both of these methods under synthetic data can achieve uh, meter level accuracy, which is even better than GPS, provided, of course, lots of uh, conditions are met, just such as line of sight connection with enough base stations. All right. So this uh, ends the part on sub six, sub six gigahertz uh, positioning. Any questions? Uh, for angular estimation, is it possible to find uh, two solutions for uh, for this equation? Because uh, if you work with angle, uh, we know we have sine and cosine, and sine and cosine are symmetric uh, over ninety degrees. Well, if you have enough base stations, there will be only one solution. Yeah. So you can be on the back side of the array, but with enough base stations, that, that would not occur. All right, so now to millimeter wave. What happens then? In millimeter wave, we can benefit from all of these nice properties, okay? So in particular, the high carrier frequency. So what do they gain us? So the, now, the, the model that people use for millimeter wave positioning is the following. We have two devices, okay, this could be a base station, this could be a user, uh, in an environment with multiple scatterers. The base station has a known position and a known orientation. Okay, the orientation now becomes important because of the antenna arrays. The user device has an unknown position and unknown orientation. Here everything is shown in 2D, but you can extend to 3D. Okay, so there's a line of sight path with a certain distance, with a certain delay, certain angle of departure, an angle of arrival. And then each of the reflected paths has a certain delay, certain angle of departure, and angle of arrival. Okay. Angle of departure is measured in the frame of reference of the transmitting device. Angle of arrival are measured in the frame of reference of the receiving device. Okay. And this orientation here, alpha, tells you how the device is oriented. Okay. So the device could have a certain position, but different orientations. The goal in millimeter wave positioning is to estimate from the received waveform, under some conditions, the unknown position and orientation together. So this is very different from traditional positioning, right? Traditional positioning, I do distance estimation with a bunch of reference stations. And in 2D, I would need at least two re three reference stations. So here, only one reference station. Okay? And in addition, I can also estimate my orientation. So let's see how this is done. Here again, there's two tracks in, of research. Uh, the first track is to do the positioning only in the delay domain. So they make use of the large available bandwidth, the sparsity of the channel, but they don't use angle information. So you consider basically a transmitter and a receiver, each with a single antenna, uh, to be single antenna devices. Later we will see when you use both angle and delay information. Okay, so now the model, again similar to before, you have base station, a user, 
The received waveform consists of multiple paths, each with a gain, a delay, and noise. Uh, there's no angle now, because the base station user are assumed to have only a single antenna. Kay. The first path can be related to the user position, and each of the other paths can be related to scattering locations or so-called virtual anchors. Okay, so if I have a reflecting surface here, I can take the mirror image of the base station, and I call this a virtual base station. Okay. So I can write my, signal, my uh, delay as a function of this virtual base station. Just a different way to write this. Okay, so now we go back to the Fisher information and Kramer rail bounds. So in this problem, uh, we have the user and the base station. The base station in this case sends a signal to the user, okay, and the user will receive a waveform which contains unknown angles and un no, I'm sorry, unknown delays and unknown channel gains. Right. Okay, so from a Fisher information point of view, the unknown is a vector of all the delays of all the multipath components and all the complex gains. It can then compute a Fisher information matrix of all of these guys. So this could be a very large information, very large Fisher information matrix if you have many paths. Kay. Now the channels themselves, we don't care for the positioning. Okay. So even though received signal strength can tell you something about positioning, it's quite unreliable. So we don't care about the channel, the channel gains. We just care about the delays. So we try to get rid of the channel gains. So we use again the concept of the equivalent Fisher information matrix to compute. Uh, the equivalent Fisher information matrix of the uh, delays. Okay, now, so we, now we have something about delays. But we don't care about delay, we care something about position, right? Okay. So what we do is we create a new vector which contains the position of the user and the location of all the virtual anchors. Okay, so recall the virtual anchors are the ones here by reflecting the base station across the reflecting surfaces. Okay. If we have this parameter, okay, we can uh, map now to a Fisher information matrix in this domain. Okay. And you do this by doing a Jacobian transformation of the original Fisher information matrix. Okay. So you have a Fisher information matrix of the delays. You can convert this to a Fisher information matrix of the position of the user and the virtual anchors. These are equivalent representations. Okay. Now the problem with this transformation is that uh, it goes from a quite high dimensional space, no, it goes from a low dimensional space to a high dimensional <coughs> space. So all of a sudden you have more parameters. And this creates a problem in the sense that the Fisher information matrix of the position and the virtual anchors is a singular matrix. So in principle, you cannot estimate all of the positions, which makes sense, right? If I don't know where I am, I, I just receive a line of side path and a bunch of multipath components, and I need to estimate myself and all of those virtual anchors, I have no hope. Now, you could do another transformation if you assume the virtual anchors are known. This means that someone has mapped the environment beforehand, okay, knows where the reflecting areas are, knows where the virtual anchors are behind the walls. So then you only have two parameters left, the user position. Okay, so you could do another transformation of the Fisher information matrix just pertaining to the user position. And now this matrix is a non-singular matrix. Okay. So this leads to something called multipath assisted localization. Okay, so I consider the line of sight path as well as each of the reflections, and they all provide useful information to me because each reflected path corresponds to a virtual anchor behind the wall. Okay, so I haven't considered the unknown clock offset here, which should be considered. Um, it turns out that this Fisher information matrix in the delay domain is a diagonal matrix when all the paths are perfectly resolvable. Okay, so that means the more and more bandwidth you get, and for a finite number of paths, uh, your matrix will become diagonal, which is nice to do inversion. All right, so this figure here shows, this is taken from this paper, uh, the position error bound, okay, because now I've computed this Fisher information matrix, I can take the inverse and then the trace and the square root, and then I find the position error bound visualized in space. Okay, so you can see that here is the reference station, the anchor, behind the anchor, behind the walls is different, different virtual anchors. And this tells you how well you can localize yourself in this environment. Okay, well, uh, the structure now is quite complex because of the interplay with the different reflections. What is interesting is that with a single reference station, you're able to localize yourself in this whole environment. Okay, and this is very different from traditional positioning where you need many reference stations. Okay. Of course, you need to be able to uh, map the whole environment beforehand. These ellipses sh show um, the, the confidence ellipses regarding the positioning there. So because the position airbound is a more compressed version of this. 
Okay, so it tells you if you are here, this will be your uncertainty. If you are here, this will be your uncertainty. So in some directions, you'll have more uncertainty than in others. Okay, but this is just the bounds. What about algorithms, right? So in terms of algorithms, uh, if you've pre-mapped your environment and you know where everything is, the localization problem becomes relatively simple. Um, when you do not pre-map the environment, so you just switch on your device, you need to learn where those virtual anchors are. And this is a problem called SLAM, which stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Okay, so I have my device, I switch it on, I start from a relatively known location, I move in the environment, I receive my waveform, the, the line of side path and all the multipath components, and as I move, I can learn where the virtual anchors are. So this is a flow chart of how this works. I, will, uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but you basically need to, every time you see a new multipath component that you cannot explain with previous virtual anchors, you create a new virtual anchor. If you don't see a virtual anchor for a long time, you, you remove the virtual anchor. All the kind of techniques that people use in SLAM. Question. Yes. Yes. Uh, because, okay, the works did it like this. I think this can also be done in the uplink. It doesn't matter for, for this work, I believe, whether you do it in uplink or downlink. Because yeah. I guess it's easier to have a map of the environment at the base station. Right? Yeah, I mean, you could preload the map to a device. That, that I don't think is a big, uh, a big bottleneck. Uh, yes, Robert. Data association. Uh -huh. This one? Yeah. So, so, no, I mean, the subscript there, it just looks uh, sort of... <laughs> <laughs> ah, OK. <laughs> I mean, is it, is, it, is it literally, it stands for association? It stands for association. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK. Because here the problem is, I have a bunch <laughs> of measurements and a bunch of virtual <laughs> anchors. I need to decide which measurement corresponds to which anchor, which virtual anchor. Yeah. So that's a data association problem. And there's a whole rich field of literature and data association. The, the, the anchors, if you assume that the anchors are known, doesn't the anchor depend also on the position of the device which is transmitting because, because the, of the reciprocity yeah. of that? Yeah, that's true. So yeah, that, that's why I guess it has to be in the, in the downlink. Mm. Right? Because the, the transmitting device, where is it? If this is the transmitter, then the virtual anchor is induced by this transmitter location. So this would not work then in the uplink. Yeah, good point. No, when you said that the, it's unreliable, the channel gain. Uh, <coughs> as a measure of as a distance. Measure of, uh, the, the distance. Uh, but uh, in principle, we can use it as a side information mm -hmm. to refine the estimate, right? Because yes. Uh, it's some prior, because there will be absorption on the anchors and the signals will be always lower. Weaker, yes. Weaker. Yes. Oh, no, for sure, you, you could use it as side information. All right, so when you do not know where the virtual anchors are, the localization becomes significantly more complicated. And you need to do some form of slam. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, in, in, in this paper, they did this. So here you had um, a device starting from some <coughs> location, switching on. It knows where the anchor is. And as it moves around, it learns where the virtual anchors are. So it basically builds up a map of the whole environment. Okay? So it, it somehow can figure out where all the reflecting surfaces are. Uh, okay, no, so this case is, no, it's this one here. So after a while, um, so this is where the device was moving on this track. After a while, it figured out that, for instance, here behind the blackboard, there was a virtual anchor. So this corresponds to the reflection of this actual physical anchor behind the blackboard. Okay, so here also for this guy, it found out a virtual anchor. Uh, there was another virtual anchor here, but this, it wasn't able to localize with very high certainty. Okay. And then there's an additional, uh, uh, anchors coming from multiple reflections. Okay, you bounce off one wall and another wall and another wall, so that gives you an anchor further away. So this was results on at one gigahertz. Um, well, th th there's two competing groups working on this, uh, one in Austria and one in Germany. <coughs> and so for uh, fairness, I should present both of their works. So this was done by the group in Germany uh, using a lower bandwidth, uh, having a transmitting device moving in the environment, localizing the device and at the same time trying to figure out where the virtual anchors are. So here is a transmitting device and after a while of walking around you're able to localize this virtual anchor. And there was another a scattering point here. So this seems to work quite well in both uh, medium and very high frequency uh, uh, bandwidths. Okay, 
So this is done only using only delay information. This is called multipath assisted localization. What about if we also use angle information? What can we gain? Make some water. <coughs> All right, so here we go back to the original problem. Anchor, agent, known position, known orientation, unknown position, unknown orientation, uh, an environment with scatterers, and this will be the channel in between them. Okay, so we have a few multipath components, a line of sight, and then reflected <coughs> paths. Each path has a complex channel gain, which for us does not carry, we don't consider the information that it carries. Uh, angle of arrival, angle of departure, and a delay. Okay, so the delay is related to the distance traveled by the wave. Okay, before we start, I want to just quickly provide some intuition of, of how this would work. So consider here a base station, right? Here a user, base station has known position, known orientation. User is here with unknown position, unknown orientation. The base station is the one transmitting information or transmitting a pilot sequence. So if you estimate the time of arrival, the time of arrival tells you something about distance, right? So the time of arrival tells you I'm on a circle around the base station. But that's not enough to localize yourself. The angle of departure tells you a line. Okay? Tells you that you must be localized on this line. And the intersection of a line and a circle gives you, well, one gives you two points, but let, let's assume we're, we know that we're on this side, gives you a single point. Okay, so with angle of departure and delay, we can localize the user. Okay, we do not know the orientation, we can just localize the user. If we also have angle of arrival, then in combination with the angle of departure, we can figure out the orientation. Okay, so this table tries to summarize what we can do. If we have angle of arrival and angle of departure, we cannot determine the position. It's not enough. Okay, you also need a delay. But it's enough to figure out the orientation of the user. Okay, so you do not know where he is, but you know the orientation of the user. <coughs> if you have angle of arrival and time of arrival, you, do know, you know nothing. Okay, you do not know where you are or what your orientation is. Angle of departure and time of arrival gives you this circle and uh, line case. So you know where you are, but you do not know your orientation. If you have all three, in principle, you can know where you are and what your orientation is. So somehow, we need to estimate all three parameters in order to do the positioning and orientation together. Question? Why is uh, orientation important to estimate? Why is orientation uh, important to estimate? Why do we need to estimate? Well, okay, we may not need it, but it's useful information to have. Mm -hmm. So from a uh, beamforming uh, point of view, it's good to know where the base station is uh, located, so that you can beam towards the base station. Right? If you know where you are, you know your, your orientation, you know where to direct your beams. So for communication purposes, it's very useful. For positioning applications, uh, I could foresee many future applications where knowing the orientation of devices could be very useful. Right? Of course, not for standard navigation, but maybe for robots or UAVs, it could be useful. Right, so this tr tries to provide a little bit of intuition of the different cases. Okay, so I think now you know how this works. You do the bounds, you do the algorithms. So let's start with the bounds. Okay, so of course the scenario is a little bit more complicated than before. We have uh, the received waveform at the user. Depends on the transmitted signal, uh, beamforming or pre-coding at the transmitter side, the channel, and then combining at the receiver. Okay, this is the standard model and that we've also seen yesterday in detail. Okay, there's multiple paths. Each of the paths has an angle of arrival, angle of departure, and a delay. So this is the mathematical model of the received waveform. The delay of the first path can be related to the user, the distance between the user and the base station. The delay of the other paths can be related to the virtual uh, anchor locations. And the angle of departure and angle of arrivals can also be related to the orientation of the user and the location of the virtual anchors. Okay, so this is just plain geometry. And again, our goal now is to estimate uh, the user position, the user orientation, even when all of these scatter locations are unknown. Okay, so it's similar to the case that we saw before with the delay domain where you, you do not know where the virtual anchors are. But remember that um, in the delay domain only, it was actually quite hard to figure out where the anchors are just on a snapshot of information without tracking. So here we can do much better. 
Okay, so the fish information matrix is like before, but now we have more parameters. So before we had the delay and the channel gains. Now we also have all the angle of arrivals and all the angle of departures. So it's become a very large vector. We have our noise-free observation, take the derivatives, and we can populate this whole matrix. So before we just had this matrix, but now we have all of these components as well. So um, this matrix, while it is, uh, it is a, it's a dense matrix in general, it is not hard to compute the individual components, but there's not a great deal of structure there. Okay, but you can compute this whole matrix, invert it, and then find a position error bound. It turns out that each block, so I, I highlight each of these blocks, each block has a certain structure. So each block can be written as the Hadamard product of three matrices. Okay, so each of the blocks, for instance, J theta R theta R, corresponding to this guy here, can be written as the Hadamard product of three matrices, so the, the, the pointwise product of three matrices. Uh, the first component relates to the receiver. Okay, so it relates to the angle of arrival that are seen, okay, and also the, the combining at the receiver. And it turns out that this first component will be close to diagonal when all the angles of, of arrivals are resolvable. So when all the angles of arrival become resolvable, this becomes a diagonal matrix. And of course, this will happen when you have more and more antennas, okay, for a finite number of angle of arrivals. There's a part related to the transmitter. Okay. Uh, this guy typically does not become diagonal, but it doesn't matter because there's also the third component which relates to the delay. Okay, so there's a third component related to the delay, which becomes diagonal when all of the paths are resolvable in the delay domain. Okay, so you have a matrix that could be full, and then two matrices that tend to diagonal when either angle of arrivals are resolvable or all the delays are resolvable. And as you know, in millimeter wave, when you go to higher and higher bandwidth, more and more antennas for a finite number of scatterers, uh, both of them will go become diagonal. Okay. So overall, in the millimeter wave regime, they, they both tend to diagonal, so combined, all of these matrices will be more or less diagonal. Okay, so what do we do with this? We have all of the parameters here, so all of the angle of arrivals, all of the angle of departures, all the delays and all the channel gains. We start reordering them, ordering them path by path. Okay, so we group all the parameters for the first path, okay, and those parameters are angle of arrival, angle of departure, delay, and gain. Okay, and we have a new matrix here, all the parameters of the second path, a new matrix here, third path, and so forth. And because all of these are diagonal, it turns out this guy becomes block diagonal. So each path provides independent information. Okay, and that's because all of the paths in this regime of large bandwidth and large antenna arrays uh, can be resolved. So you have independent information. Okay, so now this becomes our Fisher information matrix, path by path, and what we care about is the angle of arrival, angle of departure, and the delay. We do not really care about the channel. Okay, so what we do is we use the uh, equivalent Fisher information matrix to just have the uh, we remove the effect of the channel, and then we convert to the position space. So we have a fish information matrix and angle of arrival, angle of departure, and delay. We can equivalently write this as a function of the user position, user orientation, and all of the virtual, scatter lo virtual anchor locations. Okay, so this is an equivalent uh, way of writing this using the Jacobian transformation. So now we have a new fish information matrix containing position, orientation, and the virtual anchors. This big matrix, we can then again use equivalent Fisher information matrix, and then we get the information, um, the Fisher information matrix regarding the position orientation, which is really what we're interested in the end. Now, in contrast to the case where we only have delay information because of having also angle information, this matrix here is non-singular. Okay, so this means, in principle, from a single waveform received at a device, we can map the whole environment. Okay. We can map where we can determine where we are, how we're oriented, and where all the virtual anchors are. This could not be done just in the delay domain. <coughs> okay. Once we have this matrix, which is now a three by three, <coughs> matri uh, three by three matrix, we can compute the position error bound. Tells me how well we can localize the device, and the orientation error bound tells us how well we can determine the orientation of the device. As long as we have more here than here, I mean... Yeah, uh, the real would be more of the rest. Hmm? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's not <coughs> intuitive that L could be arbitrarily larger. 
Yes. Yes, but okay, for a, a small number of paths, yeah. th this is fine. Hmm? One general question I have, I mean, a lot of your equations, it looks like they're written in terms of continuous time. Yes. And they haven't been sampled. And I mean, is it just a sort of a trivial thing to just sample everything and plug it in, or do you have to do anything in particular? I mean, they're in continuous time because it's typically easier to do the math. Yeah. But of course, if you sample at a high enough rate, you can things still hold. But of course, the algorithms would uh, yeah, yeah would we'll work in digital, right? So yes. you, you would just OFDM. It's continuous, but then in practice, you use discrete time. And then yes, yes. And then we will see how close we can get to the bounds. We'll see that later. Oh, okay. All right. So again, using th th this approach from the fish information point of view. By having one waveform received at a multi-antenna device, we can localize the device, determine the orientation, and map the environment. So very good for SLAM. Um, it turns out, uh, I don't know if I want to go into great detail here, um, uplink and downlink become very different now. Okay, so we could have done this uh, <laughs> two ways. The base station with known orientation and known position transmit to the user, or the user transmit to the base station. And these become very different for the following reason. When we're doing estimation in the downlink, okay, so the base station sends to the user, the position depends on the time of arrival and angle of departure. And you know angle of departure is quite hard to estimate. When we're doing positioning in the uplink, the positioning depends on the time of arrival and angle of arrival, okay, because the base station has a known location. Okay, angle of arrival is much better to estimate. So in this case, it's actually better to do uplink localization than downlink, because you have this benefit <coughs> of good angle of arrival estimation. So this means that the uplink and downlink become very, very different in the positioning uh, using both angle and delay. All right, I want to show some visualizations of the fish information and the position error bound, and then I'll go to the algorithms. Uh, so this was a case where we had a base station um, sending beams in a two-dimensional, uh, a three-dimension, on the, but sending towards the plane. Uh, these are some of the parameters. Um, we do try to do uh, uplink or downlink localization. And for both cases, we compute the position and orientation error bound. Okay, so what I'm showing here, this is in the XY plane. Uh, these black dots correspond to where the beams from the base station cross the XY plane. And here, what I'm showing under the parameters from the previous slide is how well we can estimate the orientation. So what it turns out is that when you're somehow in, in the main lobes of the beam, you can estimate orientation quite well. When you're outside of these main lobes, you have a high degradation. And the pattern is highly non-obvious, right? And this is even for line of sight. So there, there's no reflection, no scattering at all. Because this really comes from the interaction of the different beam patterns. Uh, Localization-wise, this is how well you can localize yourself in this space. So most of this is blue, so that means you can localize yourself quite well in most of this space with transmissions from a single base station. Okay, now this is for line of sight. What happens if you put some scatterers in the environment? Will they go better or worse? What do you think? Because, I mean, you, right, you get more information, but you have to estimate more parameters. Right? So it could go either way. And in fact, it does. So this is when we put some scatterers in the environment. Here, there's three scatterers. So we estimate not just the position orientation of the user, but also the location of those scatterers. So what we see here, this figure is actually better than before. So if I go back, this was all yellow. So here now it becomes green, blue. So here the scatterers help. The scatterers help to determine your orientation because you have new sources of information. Um, in terms of the position, if you look here, this is yellow. It was blue here. So in some location that harms you. Okay, and this is because from this point of view, all these scatterers are almost more or less aligned. Okay, so it's hard to distinguish them. This is three dimensional, okay, the, the user, no, I think this is three dimensional <coughs> localized, so azimuth and elevation estimation. So only level, uh, no, no, both of them, all azimuth and elevation, but we lump together the bounds, so the, the sum of the two errors. So, so these are all camera bound yes. bounds, is that correct? So I'm thinking whether it could be a risk that when you increase the number of parameters in the model, you have these scatterers that you would need a correspondingly higher SMR before you 
to achieve that. Yes, kind of, of course. So because yeah, you you have more scatters, but maybe they're very weak, so it's hard to estimate them in practice, yeah. right? So. Yes, I mean, also in, in the bounds we have problems, right? Because if, if two scatters are very close to each yeah. other, you have too many parameters to estimate, your fish yeah, information I mean becomes singular. It's a problem of the camera bound, and it's all, it's, it's all asymptotic. Yes, exactly. So that's why in a bit we'll go to algorithms. OK, so the scatters, they, they can harm or they can help you depending where you are. But I would say overall, things are better. Okay, Overall, things are better. Question. Yes. Is it uh, a possibility that uh, the visual information uh, we get uh, a rank deficiency and we could not invert it? So it's not uh, bound to bound? Yes, so, so this can happen for these kind of cases, yes. So then you need to put additional requirements. When you consider, for instance, uh, do I include a virtual anchor or not in my, in my uh, fish information matrix? So if I know I cannot resolve it in angle and delay, then I remove it from the estimated parameters to get a non-singular Fisher information matrix. Okay, and these are all kind of like Eric says, deficiencies of using Fisher information. When you go to algorithms, they will, they will disappear. Uh, let's see if I want to do this. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about uplink versus downlink. So this figure here shows you the position error bound in uplink and downlink. Um, so this is from the previous map that we saw. We just take the, we aggregate all of the estimates and we make a CDF. Okay, this tells you in the map how well can you be localized. Okay, so this is the position error bound. In blue is in the downlink. Okay, so in the downlink, your position estimation depends on how well you can estimate delay and angle of departure. Okay. And it doesn't really matter how the, the, how the receiving device is oriented. Okay, this follows from the bounds. So as long as you, you're, 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 the base station shines on you, you can estimate the position. This means you can estimate the delay and the angle of uh, departure. In the uplink, things are different. Right? In the uplink, the user is transmitting. Okay, it, may have, it has an unknown orientation. And depending how it's oriented, the quality will change. Okay, and there's two effects here. One is that if the orientation is bad, maybe it doesn't even shine onto the base station. And the second thing is that in the uplink, the position quality depends on time delay and angle of arrival. Okay, so in that case, angle of arrival is better, so it can help you. So that's why the curves can be to the left or to the right, corresponding to the downlink. Okay, so the interplay uplink, downlink, angle of arrival, angle of departure becomes quite interesting here. Uh, for orientation error bound, you get a similar story. I'll skip that. Skip this one. Um, I want to talk a little bit about scaling with more antennas. Okay, so this is here for a finite number of paths. What happens when we put more receive or more transmit antennas? Okay. Obviously, when putting more receive antennas, things have to get better. Right? You're collecting more energy. So this is the position error bound as a function of the number of receive antennas. <coughs> and you can see the position error bound in the downlink doesn't depend on the orientation as before. And things get better when you have more and more antennas. Okay, Makes sense. In the uplink, things are a little bit different. So you're more sensitive to the rotation, okay, because maybe you're not pointing in the right direction. But you have a benefit from doing angle of arrival instead of angle of departure estimation. Okay, this means that the slope becomes different. Okay, that means for enough antennas, uh, it's better to do things in the, if you have enough antennas on the receiver side, it's better to do things in the uplink. So there's a switch point where Uplink becomes better than downlink. This is when you put more and more receive antennas. When you put more and more transmit antennas, things become very strange. So in, con in, in contrast to traditional MIMO, where you kind of light up the whole area, here we're using beamforming, right? So we have a number of beams. We keep a finite number of beams. And when we make the number of transmit antennas grow, the beams become narrower and narrower, right? So that means if you happen to be lucky in the position of a beam, you're, you're doing really well, but if you're outside of a beam, uh, too bad. So then you get this very strange behavior. Right? So let's first talk about the downlink. Okay? So the base station is using more and more transmit antennas, but a finite number of beams. User has a certain number of antennas. Performance first gets better. Okay? First gets better because you can do better angle of departure estimation. 
But then it starts to oscillate because it depends whether or not the user is in the beam or not. Okay. This effect here is even more pronounced in the uplink because for very few antennas, okay, you're depending on the angle of arrival, which is better than angle of departure, so you're doing better here. But then your curve also oscillates up and down because your beams are too narrow, and at some point you're not even hitting the base station. Okay, so while angle of uh, so while the number of receive antennas gives a kind of straightforward scaling, number of transmit antennas does not, okay, and it's because mainly because of this beam forming. Yes. The anchor locations. Yeah, Okay, well, here there's no notion of time. Everything is in a snapshot, right? So there's no notion of how long. I mean, you need to send a certain amount of training sequences to do the, to do the uh, estimation, right? Um, and here, I don't really care about those virtual anchors. I just show what happens to the position. So even if some of the virtual anchors are not estimated well at all, I don't care. As long as probably a few are good enough, it's okay. Okay, now this is all bounds, right? So you can you can question a lot of the things that we're doing. Does, does this really work? What about algorithms? So in terms of algorithms, we reuse a lot of the techniques that were talked about yesterday. Okay, so we we work based on sparsity, and I I think yeah, Nuria gave a lot of information about sparsity, so I don't think I'll go into a lot of details here. Um, let me see. I'll just go here. So what we're doing is uh, basically similar to yesterday. We have observations on different <laughs> subcarriers. They depend on the transmitted signals, the beam forming, and that we write things in a sparse <coughs> domain by using these DFT matrices and then the combining matrix. This is basically the same as yesterday. So this uh, matrix here is approximately sparse. Okay, and this is subcarrier by subcarrier. The entries in this matrix, if you're exactly sparse, depend on the gain and the delays. So this we've seen yesterday. If I vectorize this, I have again a similar expression as yesterday. Transmitted signal, beam forming, the DFT code book, combining another DFT code book, and a sparse vector. So my goal is now to recover the sparse vector plus noise. Okay, now the interesting thing here is that um, the sparsity across the sub different subcarriers, the pattern is the same. So you can use this uh, multiple measurement vector techniques. So you could write the... Um, Estimation problem as this kind of problem. So we try to minimize the reconstruction error and at the same time create this row sparsity. Okay. So that means subcarrier by subcarrier, we want to have the same sparsity pattern, but the entries can change subcarrier by subcarrier. Once we can solve this problem, and this can be done by a matching pursuit method, what we recover is angle of arrival and angle of departure up to the resolution of our dictionary. We also find uh, the delays and the gains. Now we can uh, play with these techniques of adapting the dictionary or doing, doing some refinement to get better resolution of the angle of arrival and angle of departure. Okay. So this is uh, relatively standard, so, but then you have all the estimates of the channel parameters. Then you need to convert to your position space. Right. So here things are a little bit different. So we have all the estimates of the channel parameters, angle of arrivals, angle of departure, delays and gains. Now, I want to point out that if there's some paths that are not resolvable, Okay, then it doesn't really matter. I mean, you, your message passing, your OMP method will just recover the resolvable paths. Okay. And if paths are not resolvable, it will just lump them together. Okay, so automatically it will detect how many paths are resolvable and we'll use those for positioning. So in the end, you have a vector of all the channel parameters and now you want to transform this to estimates of the position, <coughs> orientation, and all the virtual anchor locations. And here it depends a little bit on what condition you work. So the way that we did this is we, we just tried to do a least square fitting with respect to all these unknown parameters uh, to match these values. Okay. And now we, there are three cases to consider. The first one is when there is a line of sight path and we know that the line of sight path exists. Okay. So when there is a line of sight path and I know it exists, then the path with the shortest delay will be my line of sight path. So I can, for that path, then know this is the delay, this is the complex gain, angle of arrival and angle of departure. Okay. So then I have that path. 
From that path, it is then straightforward to estimate the position orientation. Okay, you have enough information to estimate position orientation, and then you can quickly estimate the virtual anchor locations. Okay, so again, if there's a line of sight, by considering the, the path with the shortest delay to be the line of sight path, from the delay estimate, you know you're on a circle. From the angle of departure, you know you're on a line. That gives you your position. Once you know the position and you know the angles and delays of the other paths, you can figure out where the virtual anchors are. So that's a relatively easy case. Okay. This then gives you an initial estimate that you can use to solve this problem. Uh, when there's no line of sight path, things become a little bit more complicated. Okay. So what we did is we, uh, we tried different orientations. We have a guess of the orientation, okay, and then you can figure out the position and then the virtual uh, anchors. And then we try all possible orientations for each of them, we, we then solve, and we have a final estimate. The one with the lowest cost is the one we retain. Uh, and then finally, there could also be the case where we do not know that there's a line of sight. Okay. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. But there, we shouldn't just take the path to the smallest delay as line of sight. So then we can do a combination of both. All right. So this is how the positioning works. It, it, it's not very sophisticated, but it turns out to work pretty well. So this is... Um, a comparison of the bound with the positioning algorithm. So the positioning algorithm, as I said, it does first this uh, simultaneous orthogonal matching pursuit with a refinement and then convert to the position space. Okay, we do not care here where the scatterers are, we just care where we are about our orientation is. So this is the scenario where there's a line of sight path and a number of scatterers. Um, I'm showing in the bottom the positioning quality, here the orientation estimation quality. Red lines are the Cremerio bounds from the Fisher information matrix, and in blue is the performance of the algorithm. So as you would expect, for sufficiently high SNR, you can get close to the bounds. Okay. <coughs> There's still a small gap, but it's not so bad. Now, what we then try to do is, what happens if we remove the line of sight? Because typically in positioning, you need a line of sight. Everything I talked about so far, we needed the line of sight. So what happens if we remove the line of sight? So we remove the line of sight, put some uh, obstacle in between, and we get this. Okay, so it's the same method. No? We do the orthogonal matching pursuit and the refinement and the converting. So what we see is still we're very close to the Cremerio bound. Okay, we there's uh, some gap depending on the implementation, but we can estimate both the orientation and the position of the user, even when there's no line of sight present, even in an unknown propagation environment. So I think this is a quite powerful result. Uh, I should point out, though, that the, the, the numerical values here, if I go back one slide, so look at the range here, okay, it's, uh, here it's much better. Right? So, so this means that while I can still estimate the parameters, my, my quality of my estimate is really bad. Similar here for the angles, goes, uh, I mean the bound here is 10 to the <coughs> minus 2, roughly, and here it's shoot up high. Okay. So the, in principle, it's possible, but you should live with some degraded performance. And this is because in the millimeter wave, your line of sight path will be the strongest. All the, the other paths are scattered of the environment and will be much, much weaker. So it makes sense. All right, so in summary of this part, I just want to say that uh, in millimeter wave, we expect to have few multipath components, lots of bandwidth available. So this means that we can resolve our paths both in delay and angle. And if we can do so, this allows us to uh, estimate not just our own position, but also map the environment. And this is especially the case when we have both angle and uh, uh, distance information. Because in that case, we don't even need to do tracking. Just on a snapshot, we can map the environment. I didn't talk very much about the role of beam forming. So what we did here is we just put some beams and see what happens. Okay? Because we're, we're doing the positioning. We do not design our beams to optimize the positioning. Okay? Of course, in practice, uh, the beam forming will play an important role in the performance. And if we want to really use the positioning in 5G, we, maybe there should be some co-design of the positioning and uh, communication in terms of the beam forming. I just have a, I mean, a couple of comments. Um, so one, it seems like this speaks to not doing like uh, the grid of beams, those sorts of techniques, because you really need the channel, not really the preferred beam location. So that you agree with that? You say we do not need to do the. Well, so like, yes, like yesterday we presented that 
you know, a lot of millimeter wave systems, including 5G, want to do this beam-based search where you kind of sweep a beam. Mm -hmm. And then we were advocating the compressed sensing-based channel estimation. And it seems here you really need the channel, not the, the former approach won't be good for positioning. I mean, is that, do you think that's correct? Well, we need, a f we need a few paths. We don't need to know the whole channel, right? As long as we can grab the line of sight path and one or two reflect it, it's okay. We don't, need to we don't care about the whole channel. We just care about the channel seen, like you said, through the lens of the receiver. Yeah. Right? We need the delays. We need at least a line of sight delay. We want a line of sight delay. And if we can get a reflected path, it's good. <coughs> okay, and then, and then when you're doing these, these um, so you have basically two steps. One is like the sparse channel estimation. Yes. And then the second step is, I guess, the position. Convert to position space. Yeah, yes. convert that. Um, and then are you looking at like you know, the hybrid arrays or any of those structures, or is it just sort of like a generic <coughs> beam training? Right but now? we don't care, right? So, I mean, that again, I, I want to say that whatever the communication people design, we will use it to the best of our right. ability. So that, right. yeah, that's what I was, and that was, I guess, my third point is I was just thinking that basically we. We should take whatever we do and pass that over to you, and then you convert it into position. Yes, exactly. That, that's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Misha. Uh, do you do some Doppler work? Would it be interesting to do a Doppler estimation? And uh, would it be <coughs> because I think high frequencies are also good for yes. you get better in Doppler so typically, Doppler spread uh, you can do well when you have large available time to do the yeah. estimation. Right, so uh, it, it, I, think, I think in millimeter, if you will send short packets, so I, I typically Doppler spread would be harder to estimate. Yeah. But in, in principle, you can include this. Here, there was no mobility. Right, but if you have an object moving away, you can use the waveforms to also estimate the Doppler. And that would give you additional information when you're running an extended Kalman filter, for instance. Yeah. Um, this is just, uh, I would say, s I think these works are just from the last year. So this is really the start of something. More questions? Okay. All right. Two more topics in 30 minutes. I think that's good. Um, one thing I didn't talk about very much was cooperative positioning. So I always said there's a user and a base station, and they send information uplink or downlink, and that's it. So now we'll, I'll change the story a little bit. What happens when there's device to device communication, and maybe both devices do not know where they are. Okay. But there's a third party, a reference station, that can communicate with them. Can we have some benefit from this device-to-device -device communication? All right. So here is a scenario with three mobiles, and there's device-to-device -device links between them. Okay. So in this case, as we will see in a little bit, uh, these device-to-device -device links, they provide additional accuracy. Because this means your uncertainty will shrink with respect to a setting where you remove these device-to-device -device links. Secondly, there could be devices that are outside of the, uh, are not connected to base stations. Okay? And in that case, they can only talk to these other devices, and they, tr they can try to localize themselves with the help of these other devices. Okay? So when I, I can estimate the location orientation of this guy and this guy, I can help this third guy. So these are the two benefits and principle of cooperative localization. So you can guess my story, right? So performance bound and algorithms. OK, so in cooperative localization, the model becomes now a little bit richer. So we have a network with agents. Okay, these are my mobile devices. And a, uh, a bunch of reference stations. This then induces a graph if I have a certain communication range, okay, so with vertices and edges. And there will be measurements okay, along nodes that are connected. And these measurements here uh, depend on the, on the states of those two nodes. So here, let's consider only position, but in practice, it could be position and orientation, plus some noise. Okay? And these measurements could take on many forms. It could just be a raw sampled waveform. It could be estimates of the channel parameters, or it could even be, in an extreme case, the relative position. Okay? Because what I talked about so far is that, okay, I have two devices that are communicating. I can estimate the relative position orientation of myself with respect to the other device. And I can consider that then as a measurement in a cooperative positioning system. OK, so this will be the highest level of abstraction, where a measurement is just the relative position between two devices plus some noise. Okay, So this relative positioning is 
determined from everything we've seen up to this point. And the quality of this measurement depends on the uh, specific algorithm that you use, or you can uh, get this from the performance bound as a rough indication of the quality. OK, so let's work with this model because it, it's very easy and it's somehow plausible in the context of 5G positioning. So now I have a network of devices. Uh, there's these three agent devices and two reference stations. So how will, this, how will the bound then look? So now the unknowns are the positions of all of the agents. Right? So there's position of reference stations, they're known, so we don't need to consider them, just the position of the, the agents. Okay, these are our measurements. So then in combination we can figure out what is the Fisher information matrix. Okay, so the Fisher information matrix is now a big matrix. Uh, if you have two dimensional position, it'll be of size 2n by 2n. And the entries are given as follows. So for a diagonal element, the Fisher information regarding to the position of a certain agent is a sum of informations coming from all of the neighbors. Okay, so again, I have to take derivative with respect of the <coughs> mean of the observation, with respect to the unknown, I have the covariance matrix. After some math, I find this sum. Okay, so what this means is that the Fisher information for a certain agent is a sum of precisions, so inverses of these measurement covariances, over the agent neighbors, plus a sum over the anchor neighbors. So I get information from agents and from anchors. So these are the diagonal elements. Then there's also off-diagonal elements. Okay? So for each uh, pair, xi and xj, there's off-diagonal Fisher information, which is zero if there's no link. And it can be shown to be equal to this, so the inverse of the covariance along that link, when there's a link between the two. So this gives me the structure of this whole Fisher information mm -hmm. matrix. So I can break down now this Fisher information matrix into three parts. Okay, so remember, there's the diagonal part, which has a sum of two components and an off-diagonal component. So they give me something like this. Okay, so the total Fisher information of all the positions of all the agents is a block diagonal matrix corresponding to information from the reference stations, a block diagonal matrix corresponding from information from your neighbors, and then a reduction of information due to the off-diagonal elements. And this has a nice uh, interpretation. So when you do cooperative localization, you have reference stations. You treat your friends as anchors. But because they're not anchors, there's a reduction of information. Okay, so it's, it's maybe good to do an example. So these are the three agents and two reference stations. If I s forget about my, uh, my covariance matrix of the measurement, my Fisher information matrix will be a 6 by 6 matrix, uh, containing the locations of all of these three guys. This information coming from the anchors. Okay, so for agent one, I have two anchors, so I have two times information. For agent two, I only have one time information because I'm only connect to one anchor. For agent three, I'm not connect to any anchor, so I got a zero here. So this is the information for positioning of the three guys without cooperation. Okay. And then there's a second matrix here, which relates only to the cooperation. So agent one is connected to one friend. Agent 2 is also connected to one friend, and Agent 3 is connected to two friends. That's why I got this here. Okay, but now I need to subtract uh, information because uh, all well the friends do not know where they are. Okay, and that gives me this matrix here. So this is the total matrix here. And you, what you see now is, for instance, that without cooperation, the matrix is singular, because there's one guy I cannot localize. But with cooperation, the matrix becomes full rank. I can then take the inverse of this fresh information matrix and compute the position error bound for each of the agents. It turns out for this case that, for instance, agent 1 has the lowest position bound because he's connected to both of the anchors. Agent 2 is doing a little bit worse, okay, and agent 3 is doing the worst because he has two sources of information, but they're both unreliable. Okay, so this gives some nice indication of the benefits of cooperation. Okay, you, do con you can do all kind of fa fancy mathematics with this. For instance, this recent work that tries to relate this structure to the graph Laplacian, and you can do all kind of uh, analysis based on that. Okay. So this is the fundamental performance bounds. Of course, there's also algorithms. Um, early work in this area, this is from uh, 2005, has basically extended least squares to a cooperative scenario. So in least squares, what we do is we have a certain guess of all the positions of everyone, and then we refine this guess. Okay, by doing the gradient descent. So we compute the gradient of the least squares cost function, and then we move in a certain direction. 
It turns out for a cooperative scenario, we can do this as well. So I have my gas, people around me have their gas, and there are some reference stations that have a known location. And I adapt my gas based on what everybody else is telling me around them. And this has a very nice, um, somehow mechanical interpretation. So th this is taken from this paper. So what I have here is um, uh, these pins here are the reference stations that I put on the floor. These here without the black uh, line are the agents. And then I have here springs, and the springs are related to the distance measurements. Okay. And what I, I then let this go, and this will go into a certain configuration of minimum energy, and that's the same as a least square solution. This is a kind of beautiful in, in implementation. This is for the static scenario. Uh, you can also do this for a dynamic scenario, so you would have an extended Kalman filter or a particle filter running on this high dimensional <coughs> state, or you can also do things distributed. So in terms of distributed methods, um, what you would have is, uh, let's say, an extended Kalman filter, where you would, at a certain time, have a state. The state estimate has a certain mean, it's where you think you are, and a certain covariance matrix. Right. And then everybody moves. Okay, so then everybody makes a prediction of their mean and covariance matrix based on their own mobility model. So then, and then you start measuring with respect to your friends and the reference stations. So then you need to correct your distribution to be more concentrated. And there's a, a beautiful theory called belief propagation and, and uh, Bayesian graphical models to do this. And if you want to know more, this is a very nice overview uh, on this work. So this is some of our own work. Um, so this here is for a certain scenario with a number of agents, uh, 100 agents moving around in an environment, but very few are at reference stations. So there's not enough reference stations to localize everybody. And they run this type of extended Kalman filter. And what I show here is the, C, uh, the cumulative uh, CDF over at some point um, across all of the agents. So what you see is that if they don't cooperate, you have a large error. And this is because you do not have enough anchors. And then we start to, to switch cooperation on, so you help your neighbors and you use this information to improve your position estimates, you can get huge gains. Okay. And the gains depend on a number of factors, including how many friends you can talk to, and the quality of the relative measurements. Okay, this is what I want to say about cooperative localization. Okay, so with 5G, there is this opportunity for device to device. We can use this to get extra information to push this into our network with these relative measurements. We can get benefits in terms of both coverage and accuracy. And of course, uh, the synchronization then becomes again more challenging, right? Because you can assume a reference station is synchronized to a global clock, but you can probably not assume all the agents are synchronized to such a global clock. So the synchronization issue should be considered here too. Any questions about cooperative localization? Everybody's getting hungry. Me too. All right. The last part is uh, just three slides on the, the synergy between localization and communication. So you know that a millimeter wave, you, if you have lots of antennas, you can point these beams in a certain direction. Okay, you can point very narrow beams, but if you don't hit your target, you don't have a good link. Um, and there's some work on using out-of-band information, okay, maybe position information, to point your beams in the right <coughs> direction. Now, what we know here is that you can actually use in-band information. Okay, so you can, while you're doing, sending the beams, you can determine where the user is and then refine this. <coughs> Because you can probably do much faster for the initial access by leveraging position information. I just want to talk about three works in this area. So in this work, what we did is we had two devices. Okay. Um, actually, one had a known position all the time. The other one had an unknown position. And we do this hierarchical beam search. So we're sending first wide beams and then narrow and narrow until we home into the user. Now, if we have some position information about where the user is, this helps us in two ways. Okay, so first of all here, on the left figure, I show as a function of distance between the two devices, how long it takes to do run the protocol of the hierarchical beam search. So if you have no position information, you need to try all the possible combinations, right? So that takes a fixed time, no matter how, how far the transmitter and receiver are away from each other. But if you have some position information, you can limit your beam search to a certain region. Everything here is for line of sight. Okay, and 
depending on the amount of uh, information you have about the other user, you can drastically reduce your uh, time to do the protocol. And as a side effect, the further away the user is, the narrower the angle interval uncertainty is, so the faster you can run the protocol. So that's one benefit. The other benefit is you get a gain in SNR. Okay? Because you're limiting your search in this hierarchical search to a certain region, you make fewer mistakes. You have less possibility of mis making a mistake. So then this gives you a gain in terms of the SNR. So we have a two-sided effect of using location information. And here we consider out-of-band location information, for instance, using GPS. Now, we can also use in-band location <coughs> information. So what we did in this work was um, we considered the hierarchical beam search, where you first send broad beams and then narrower and narrower. But as we send the beams, we also determine the position orientation. And as soon as we have a good enough position estimate, we can make the beams really narrow. So what we're showing here on this figure is how long it takes to run the protocol, this, this hierarchical beam search, in space, normalized with respect to the traditional search. Okay, so the traditional search takes some time. So this shows how much faster you can do by using location information in band during the training protocol. Okay, so one is the worst case. That means you're doing, takes the same time as the traditional protocol. And uh, the lower values means you do much better. So it turns out if you're very close to the, to the transmitting device, you can quickly estimate your position very well. And then you can start sending beams highly directional to the user. Okay, and then the further away you go, the, <coughs> the more you degrade it. And here you have this uh, strange behavior. That's because there's a scatter in the environment. So this uh, creates some impairments here behind. Okay, so inbound information could be useful to speed up this initial access problem. The last thing that we looked at, this is a work we presented last week at ICC, is uh, during the beam alignment, how much position information can we collect? Okay, so we consider the following case where we have a certain time to do the data transmission. We allocate part of this time to do the beam alignment and part of this time for the data transmission. And we can choose how much time we devote to both. Okay? The more time we devote to beam alignment, the better the beams we will have to, to use for communication, and also the more uh, position information we collect. But of course, there's a trade-off because the more time we spend here, the less time we have available for communication. Okay, so we have a measure of the effective rate during data transmission, which depends on the SNR and how much time we spend on the beam alignment. Okay. So there's a trade-off between the rate that we get effectively during this transmission and the position information that we collect. And these kind of figures can show the, the trade-off between the two. So what this shows is the position error bound as a function of the rate. Okay. And we show for different kinds of uh, subcarrier spacing how both of these relate. I don't want to go into detail now because I'm getting tired, but you can ask uh, during the lunch break. OK, I think I will wrap up now. Um, so this will be a kind of summary of what I talked about. So in general, radio waves are very useful for providing position information. Uh, in particular, 5G has lots of advantages, uh, in particular going to a millimeter wave, in particular using uh, high bandwidth and large antenna arrays. Uh, we can use this high resolvability in this domain to do accurate time and angle estimation with a high degree of resolvability. Uh, so we, this means we can localize ourselves with a single anchor. Okay. Very different from traditional positioning. Uh, we can also do SLAM. So we can map the environment with a single anchor. Okay. Very different from traditional positioning. Uh, we can do some form of location-aided communication. Okay. Because we can do in-band positioning, we can, in principle, leverage this position information to speed up communication, to track beams, to, to track devices. Uh, I foresee also some potential for radar. Right. So you can uh, think about... Well, RATCOM lock, uh, radio communication and localization, everything in one system. Um, processing can be a base station or user device, so uplink and downlink, and they're very different okay, for multiple reasons. Synchronization is something I only touched upon very briefly, but will be a major challenge when you start to implementing these kind of techniques. And at the end, I have a number of references for each of the sections, and I will upload the slides uh, later today. Okay, thank you. <coughs>